Yeah, always. Welcome, everyone, to another Malazan live discussion. All the spoilers in the world for Reaper's Gale. This is, of course, the Fantasy Network, and I am, of course, also Jimmy Nuts. I am accompanied by the usual suspects here, which is Philip and Joanna. Uh, Joanna, how are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm, I'm great. I like your glasses. Are they new? No, I've had them for a while, but yeah, <laughs> I have to wear them after a certain point at night. So that's that's fair. I have to wear mine. <laughs> at all times uh but i i just remember last time that you had stolen my glasses that's right um, yeah i i didn't come in jimmy fashion tonight <laughs> okay <laughs> philip how you doing man i'm doing well and if i weren't wearing my glasses you'd be seeing me <laughs> looking at the screen and <laughs> i could not <laughs> i can see about like this far so uh yeah but it's great to be here jimmy and i want to congratulate you as someone uh, already did in the chat on passing 5,000 subscribers. So awesome. Very, very awesome and well deserved. And you're, this is the beginning of, of many, many more. I'm, I'm confident. So, yeah. Mm, pretty, congratulations, pretty well. Jimmy. Very well deserved. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, uh, I never thought it would uh, reach to 5,000 ever because, uh, you know, I'm just here talking books, uh, but it's been pretty special. And honestly, these are some of my favorite videos I get to make. Uh, as I was thinking about this today and I was doing the prep, uh, I think I took about three and a half hours to go through my notes today. Like these are so much work, but in a good way. I really enjoy it. Yeah. It kind of feels cozy doing these, does it not? Like, you know, listen, the Malazan fandom has been really swell to me. <laughs> so, and uh, I, I've, I've heard other people say, uh, you know, different things. I also always feel like I need to be on the bottom. So my guests are on the top. That's why I switched it. <laughs> oh, um, okay. I wonder what happened. I there. always feel better whenever I'm on the bottom. I don't know why. I feel like I'm, you know, I should lift you guys up. You're lifting you know, us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just boom. Uh, but I feel cozy when I do these because one, uh, everyone is very, very kind when I mess up all the pronunciations multiple times over and over and over. And when I forget stuff, but I don't know these chats, I, I just feel like it brings out some of the best discussion in me as a reader. And I love hearing your guys's perspective and Alan's and AP's and everyone else's. Um, but I, I've been so excited for these, uh, for these talks every single time, but especially for Reaper scale, because there's a lot that happens here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a ton. Yeah. Um, I will announce uh, for anyone watching this Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, I believe it's January 8th, I will be going live just for a live Q&A to celebrate 5K subs and uh, maybe answer some questions you all have. I will be accompanied by my lovely wife. Uh, she's never been featured on the channel. So that is, uh, I guess, the wife reveal is what they call it, <laughs> which is very I love odd. It when spouses are on people's channels, I love that so much. I see people like branded as wife reveal or husband reveal. And it, I always it, go, it sound like you've had her locked in a closet all this time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do have spacious closets here. Um, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> four bed, three bath. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Yep. Some people are popping in here now. Thank the Lord for this discussion before I was so lost in this book. Well, Darren, guess what? There's like three times in my notes in big capitals. It says, ask Philip Chase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm glad that uh, he's here. And, and Joanna now, Joanna finished Molasin recently. I did. Yeah. I finished it. Oh my goodness. I cannot wait for you to finish Jimmy. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts. I'm so end. nervous for this to be over. I, though I'm not in a way because there's so much other stuff. I'm going to read the Asselmon series, the prequel, all the stuff, but it, it is like, man, there's so much anticipation. And I also, by the way, I just finished Toll the hounds and the amount of epicness that that brought and Reaper's Gale and the bone, all of them, right, man, I don't know how you wrap up a series like this. It's going to be really, really interesting. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm going to be so quiet. <laughs> I'm going to try to be so quiet. There's so much I want to say about it, but uh, well, I won't give anything away. Well, how about that? We will, we will um, jump in the Reaper scale here, but Joanna, if you could sum up Malazan without any spoilers mm. uh, in one sentence, what would it be? One sentence. <laughs> 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 how do I do that? I, wow. I, I trust um, you. Well, <laughs> I, man, how do I sum it up? I mean, obviously the themes that we were talking about of empathy and compassion come to mind, mm -hmm. but this series is so, it's so much bigger than its small parts, if that makes sense. It just, it's, it's so epic in scale. It's so incredible. And what I'll say though, is I was very satisfied when I finished The Crippled God. I did not see where it was going. And as I never see where any Malaz and Book of the Fallen <laughs> book true. was going, um, I had I had an idea and I was totally wrong. 
And I will say without giving away much that there were so many emotions and uh, I was very satisfied. Did I understand everything? No, there were a lot of things I still, I'm still trying to understand. I'm still figuring out, but it's just, it's incredible, Jimmy. I can't even just, I just can't wait for you to finish. That's I'm sorry. Excellent. I'm not selling the one sentence. No, it's okay. Oh, that's a good fill up chase. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Erickson's not brief and neither are we. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um I, I see a lot of uh love from europe yeah anybody that's waking up at 3 a.m to see this that is uh very humbling thank you yeah. very much wow. um there's yeah. an immense amount of pressure now so thanks no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> um and some people are saying in the chat you know they had a tough time with this book i'm going to be honest uh and i said this in my wrap up and, and i mean this in the most positive way possible out of the first seven this was probably my least favorite but mm -hmm. it's not one of those things where it's like totally off the rails it's still like a four and a half star book for me like i love this book i think it has some of the best moments in the series so far for me mm -hmm. uh it was just i did feel like i was tripping up a little bit and then um some stuff with the patriotist i didn't necessarily latch on to as much mm -hmm. but i think there's a lot of really good stuff and as i looked over my notes today i said man and by the end of this discussion, Reaper's Gale might end up being my favorite. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't you know, know. It's, it's so funny about this book because I felt I had the same experience, by the way, Jimmy. There were okay. certain storylines like with the patriotists and uh, that I just didn't quite resonate with as much as mm -hmm. previous story. And that's the challenge of reading a Malazan book. It's, and the thing is, I don't think you have to love every storyline to be a huge mega Malazan fan, in my opinion, yeah. because there are so many storylines. But as a first time reader, some of them are just probably not going to tug your heartstrings. Not every single one will. Mm -hmm. But I can say after finishing The Crippled God, I am even looking at this book back at this book a little bit differently. Uh, and awesome. I, I will say though, that, um, for this, my experience of this book was very similar. I really struggled to connect to a lot of the storylines, mm -hmm. um, until the end. And then I don't know if this was the experience for you, but the end got me hard on this one. Oh, the ending, the ending was tremendous. It was true. Like I said, I mean, so there's some, I think there are series defining moments that happen in this book. Um, at least from what I've read so far. Yeah. Uh, and I just I thought agree. it was incredible. Uh, Philip, uh, you are a very experienced Malazan reader, uh, at least compared to me and Joanna, right? Because me and Joanna yeah. are our first time. Uh, Philip, what's your experience with this book? I think this is, uh, this is a, a book that I'm trying to remember the first time I read it. And I think I, it was similar to Joanna. And and yeah, and perhaps you as well. Uh, it took me a little while to figure out where it was going, but I think that the second time um, it was a very different experience. And there's a, <laughs> there's a way there. Are, like Joanna said, when you 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 finish the series, you look back that that has a tendency to change some of the things you thought you understood in earlier books. Mm -hmm. And that's even more true, I think, for me on the second read. Um, so there were things I was probably a little more aware of, more looking out for, and some thematic ties. Sometimes it, it, on a surface level, on, a, on the surface plot level, you don't immediately see what this has to do with what else is going on, but there's a thematic connection. And often Erickson brings these things all together anyway in yeah. the classic Malazan convergence. Um, but there, there are some beautiful aspects to this book that I, I just want to touch on here in a non-spoiler way, because we're, we're avoiding spoilers right now, aren't we? Uh, not really, but if you would like to kind of give a mission statement, we can do yeah. that. Yeah. Well, just for me, it was interesting because uh, this was not on camera. I was talking uh, with AP and, and with Steven Erickson at one, one time. We were doing a recording, but we, you know how you always chat with somebody ahead and, and afterwards. Oh, yeah. So at the time, AP and I were reading Reaper's Gale, and... There are large elements of this book that um, uh, Stephen Erickson, I hope I'm not misquoting him here, but I, I know he used the word futility. Um, there's a lot about futility in here in, in terms of human endeavors and our conception of ourselves as being the center of everything and, and uh, our, our impact on the environment and the idea that our culture, not only in, on, a, on a, the level of the ego and Am I the center of the universe, you know, but also we tend to think of our own cultures as being the greatest, as being normal, as being central. That's and, right. So there's a lot of that in here. And this is such a Malazan thing uh, that I, I love about this series is that it has this tendency to knock you out of that perspective 
that perspective that I'm the center of everything and my culture and my way of doing things is normal and everything else is weird or, or different or even bad. Um, and what he does in here is I think that he absolutely just tears that, and that conception away from you. And so that is something I, I love about this book. And he also does it in ways that are very deeply moving and, and very uh, incredibly, uh, I, I cried at, at certain points in this book and I'm sure you, you might have too. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> I cried harder actually at the end of this book than I think I cried out of any book I read last year. Yeah. Yeah. Erickson does that to me <laughs> frequently, <laughs> but, but it's because why do I cry when I read these books? Most of the time it's when these moments of connection happen, when you have two people or two groups that think of themselves as enemies as, as, and they hate each other. And suddenly there's this act of mercy or this, this, this breakthrough in understanding and a ch total change in perception, a shift. Yeah. And, and you know, where I'm, uh, the major part I'm talking about, this happens many times, but it happens on a personal level, like between, you know, ferret and sort and, and beat, for example, you know, there's an evolving yes. relationship there that, that takes twists and turns and it becomes such a deep and beautiful thing. The relationship between the two of them, they become friends. Um, and then of course, the whole conflict with the Malazans and, and the, uh, the Laveri and of course all... the Tais Edur, all of that suddenly in the midst of that, everything changes and foe becomes fellow human being. And, and this is something that Erickson does better than anyone on the planet, in my opinion. And he does it so well in Reaper's Gale, which is why I love this book. Uh, so yeah, there's just a lot. It's, it's a, such a rich book and there are so many characters. Like, oh my goodness. So if you want to talk about the, the ones uh, who are fleeing together as a group and um, you know, the, uh, the hunted they're called in, in the, uh, the, the character list and you have Udinas and his relationship yeah. with all these people that, he, that he's with and, and the, the, the absolute, you know, bitterness and acrimony between him and fear. But then there are these moments of them kind of understanding each other or his relationship with Saren, which that has its ups and downs. And that is absolutely just, uh, it's, it's devastating and it's beautiful all at once. And how, how did, how does an author do that? You know, yeah. how, how do you devastate me and, and give me this sense of wonder all at the same time? It's just so amazing. So yeah, I, I love this book. Uh, and I, I can never say which Malazan book is the worst or the best. Right. Yeah. I don't think that that, I think we're all past that. Right. The one I'm reading right now is the best one. Yeah. That's fair. I, I like feel that. the same way. It's so it's, um, it's impossible for me to do that. And uh, I probably, and I just think what you said was so beautiful, Philip, like all of it. And actually, I remember when you discussed the theme of utility, as you said that that came up in your discussion with Steven Erickson, as soon as you said that word, it just suddenly shifted the way I looked at this book. Yeah. And, and it made it, um, man, what's the right word for it? It made it sort of, sort of there was something just so, so bittersweet about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so heartbreaking and beautiful and... Uh, what you said about the relationships and the way that those shifted throughout the book too, with those characters, with even the Lethary and the Malazans, that's so beautifully said as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, I, I'm sure we're going to have a bunch of awesome insights as we go through this, because uh, there are a lot of themes of people coming together. Um, talk comes to mind with red yeah. mask and stuff like that. Yep. Um, we're going to go through this just like we've done all the others. We're going to do it chronologically and I'll go over points and reactions and all those things. And we'll kind of elaborate on the points we find more interesting. Uh, so this is kind of a recap in some ways. Uh, I, I've actually got a lot of feedback saying people appreciate that. Uh, so I've decided to keep it um, kind of in the details a bit as we go along here. I don't have any trivia. Uh, there was none on the Malazan wiki, which is unfortunate. But I do want to ask Erickson. He mentions that a UFC fighter in the past has worn a Malazan quote on his fight trunks. And I was wish I was really hoping Erickson would be in the chat tonight so I could ask him who is that because I'm a massive mixed martial mm -hmm. arts fan. Um, so if anyone knows that, let me know in the chat. If not, hopefully one day I can ask Erickson myself. Uh, but we'll jump into the prologue, which the thing I love about this prologue is that it's pretty much the sequel to the Midnight Tides prologue. 
um, where we see, you know, everything get iced. Uh, we're seeing the sundering, a massive beast, uh, the size of a dragon, uh, which I was like, what in the world is this? It turns out it's the four curl, a sail, uh, Kilimandar shows up pretty much confirming that. Yeah. Uh, and we see right after ruin is killed, uh, Gothis male and Kilimandaros, uh, are all together and Kilimandaros wants to kill soul taken Scabadari, but Gothis says she can, but only if she can trap Scabadari's soul in a finest. It's a huge moment here because Kilimandaros punches a hole through the Sc Scabadari skull, which we see in midnight tide. So I was just like, Hey, that's the thing. Uh, whenever the brothers find the big skull, uh, which was pretty awesome. Um, and then obviously, uh, Gothis claims the finest in Scabadari's soul. And there's also another item that Gothis pulled out that I wasn't sure about what it was. And then we see, um, moving off from that, we see like a half a million people are coming on the land in these canoes. And we're like, who in the world is this? And who is this masked man with a chain chamals running next to him? I love this prologue. I thought <laughs> like, like we even got some callbacks where you're like, I understand that. That's crazy. This is a Malazan book. I never understand the prologues. I'm understanding stuff. And then a whole new set of questions <laughs> gets asked uh, here. And I just thought it was great to continue on uh, from the Midnight Tides prologue because that was such a good prologue for Midnight Tides as well. Yeah. Do you have a comment here from Frank B? Gotho steals every single scene. I agree with you, Frank. Yes. And he steals the finest uh, as well. He you know? sure does. <laughs> so, which becomes a very important detail later on, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, yeah. So is it Gothos? Is that how it's pronounced? Uh, that that's how I say it, Gothos. I like yeah. that more. It sounds cooler than Gothos. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've it's never not... heard it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did tonight, uh, and yeah. I'm sure I will mess up the rest of these pronunciations as we go. Yeah, um, no <laughs> so we open up part one of Reaper's Gale, and we see the Lethary is expanding their empire, and they are really fearing these remaining tribes they are going to band together, which we know are the all. Uh, they've had thousands of casualties in the skirmish by a group they do not know, and I automatically wonder, hey, are those the people from the canoes in the prologue? It turns out it was. Um and we also meet a person named Tanal Yathvanar, who I want to just mm. say is a disgusting dude. Yeah. Uh, and the Patriotists are the worst. <laughs> they're yeah. the absolute worst. Yeah. Uh, they're the secret police of the Lethary Empire, and they are basically finding out who's loyal and disloyal. They are the, you know, the jury, the judge, and the executioner, the whole nine. Uh, and I don't like them very much. D did you guys uh, mm. enjoy the Patriotists? No. <laughs> I didn't. I, I don't think enjoy is the right. <laughs> uh, Tanal like, especially was hateable. Oh, he's yeah. the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty close between him and his and his boss though. Um, so uh, is that Caros? Is that Caros and Victad? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they're they're loathsome human beings, uh, mm -hmm. but they are human beings, and so you have to ask yourself, well, what. Uh, what do they represent in us? And um, there's probably, unfortunately, a little Karos and Victad in, 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 in a lot of us, you know? Um, so. Yeah, maybe not to that extent, though. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not in me anyway. <laughs> uh, and, you know, actually, uh, I'll come back to that point. Um, I, 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 pick, I, I really enjoy the tour read-along that they did over there for each book of Malazan. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. amazing. And Erickson at the end of some books did Q&As, and I picked out a couple things from those that we'll cover at the end if we have time. Uh, and one of them happens to kind of be about some of the more gruesome scenes from The Patriotist that I thought was really, uh, really good answer by Erickson. He's so clever. Um, but we also get a new group of people that I adored. It's the second best group in the book, in my opinion. But uh, Silchas, Ruin, Fear, Udinas, Saren, and Kettle, which we kind of alluded to earlier when we were kind of talking in, in brief spoilers. Um, I like this little group. Uh, oh, that was my favorite storyline in this book. It's I so good. love them. Yes. It's yes. a dysfunctional quest party. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is a little bit. I wouldn't say it's like a subversion of the quest. No. plot in, in fan. I don't think that's at it at all. I think it's just done really well in a realistic way. Well, they're they're at, on a quest, all of them. They're after the same thing. They want to do something different with it, but they're all after Scavendari's soul, essentially. Um, and yeah. So they, they all want to do something different. That's the problem. So that's yes. why there's this, this tension among them as well, because they know once they get there, their, their, their uh, commonality is going to melt away real fast. Yeah, it, and it's interesting that they all have a group goal, but individual, uh, you know, goals and motivations individual and whatnot. Motivations, and, yeah, yeah, and that's just at the heart of every good conflict. 
is personal motivations and yep. uh, conflict within the soul, as Faulkner would say. Um, yep. It's really, really well done. And I think it could be the strongest portion of this book. Uh, I There is another group we'll talk about later that I like more just because of the characters. But I think thematically, this is one of the better things in this book. Um, and then we see Tehol and Bug, our favorites. I mean, if it's not your favorite, I don't know what to tell you, people. Um, <laughs> they're going to mine under everything and collapse buildings. <laughs> I, I like that's like immediately out the gate what they're talking about. And there's a really good quote. And I think it's from Tehol. And it says inequity else. How can the power be assessed? How can the gifts of privilege be valued for there to be rich? There must be poor and more of the latter than the former. I mean, that's just our world, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Tehol is brilliant. And he, his yes. brilliance for me came to the forefront much more in this book uh, than it did in Midnight Tides. And I, I could have just missed it in Midnight Tides. I loved him in Midnight Tides. I thought he was fantastic. But I still didn't, um, I don't know. I just thought he was more funny than anything and more quirky. And I didn't really understand what why he was doing what he was doing. Um, <laughs> and in this book, I just felt like I got him more mm. and just saw his insights come forward in such a brilliant way. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was a little more uh, strong armed in this one in, in a good way, in my opinion. Like it really felt like you're like, OK, Teho is a jokester and all this stuff. But he we already knew he's a genius. But now he's making big, big moves uh, that kind of build off Midnight Tides in the rep, rep, uh, you know, the um, reputation that he built um, with us as readers. Yes, because like in Midnight Tides, we knew his reputation and we knew that he was doing things. But in this book, I felt like we really saw saw more of that come forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Donkey 22 uh, says the quest party was cool, but I was confused when uh, reading it. I thought we were on a quest for blood eye. And then I don't think we ever met him. We'll kind of talk about what happens, but I do want any questions that come up. I'd like to answer because I, I kind of look at this as a resource for all of us, uh, but they were after uh Scabidari's soul. Uh, if, if I understood that correct, is that right, Philip? That is correct. Yeah. And, and Rupert Crump has uh, essentially answered the question in there as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Wonderful. Thanks for uh, the help out there, Rupert. I appreciate you. Yep. Um, okay. So then we meet Red Mask and we're going to talk a whole bunch about Red Mask as he's all throughout this. And I think he's probably one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial part of this book. Uh, I also have another Erickson quote from the Q and a that I really enjoyed about Red Mask that I'll read at the end. Um, but he carries like this blade whip and a two headed ax. And like, I was immediately in like out of, there's a lot of badass characters in Malazan. Yeah, he stood out, you know, I, to, to get a character to stand out. It's book seven is very, very impressive, I think. Yeah. yeah. And he's also stalking the Lethary and murdering, murdering them, representing the all, which are obviously the clans that are left over. Um, and he also, by the way, has two Kachin Chamao just hanging around. And yeah. I thought I was like, oh, that's the guy from the prologue. Like Erickson very rarely, at least it feels like gives us all the stuff from the prologue answered so quickly, but it was like stuff was just kind of there as I, as I read this book. And I think that's why I felt like this was in some ways the easiest Malazan book to read, but in other ways I did get a little confused towards the ending, which, which we'll, we'll talk about. I have my, my big bold font that says confused uh, anywhere I got <laughs> lost. So, um, and we couldn't talk about Reaper's Guild without talking about how amazing Kettle is and how creepy and her giving these weird half prophecies within the quest. Like, I feel like she kind of made the group excel in a lot of ways uh, to come off the page with prophecies. And that's a personal bias because I love prophecies. Oh, can you can you because um, I don't really remember specifically. Can you uh, do you have any of those prophecies? at hand i i do not you have caught me with my oh, pants down okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the page because i just go i don't remember but she does say a lot of interesting things and yes. it does feel like she sort of holds the in some ways it felt like she sort of holds the morale of the group together hmm. i don't know like the because she's well, she's a child she's a child she, I, she represents this innocence in the group yeah. i mean there's just a I love that. I love that about her, um, how she sort of is that innocent archetype in this story, as well as bot as not bottle, I'm sorry, um, beak, which we'll talk about later on. Yeah. But it's I think it's really powerful. I think when I was reading that storyline, it was very interesting just to see her relationship with Udinos yeah. and how he would hold her hand, these like little tender moments. Yeah. Because Udinos is such a broken and 
person. He's just, he just always seems that way to me, just very cynical all the time. He has a bitterness to him. And I love Udinas. I just, every yeah, time I, I read from his perspective, oh, I just love that character so much. Yeah. Uh, he grew on me so much, especially in this book. And with Sarah and Pettick, and I, I'm excited for us to talk about Sarah and Pettick and Udinas eventually, but, um, and their interactions with each other. But uh, Sarah Pettick, she has been actually one of my favorite characters in this series. And something yeah. that really stood out to me when I read about her character in Midnight Tides was how she, uh, when she was growing up, she really despised her innocence She, as a child. Yeah. She hated that her parents let her get away with things because she was a child. She wanted to be held to the same standard. It just felt like an insult to her dignity in a way to be a child. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like she didn't have a good relationship with that. And as a result, there was talk, there's some passages about how she got involved with, I think a priest or some older man. Uh, she was kind of in some scandalous relationship. Uh, so it seemed like she's always been kind of getting involved in some scandals, but it's always used in her mind, I think, to, to beat herself up. She yeah. uses so many of these stories and situations that she's been in. I think there's sort of like a self-sabotage element in her. And she just uses so much to beat herself up. And so for her to look at Kettle, I think that was such a interesting, profound dynamic there, given her own struggle with innocence. And of course, as we know, early on in the book, very early on, Kettle is raped. And just to see how... Right that is reflected back to Sarah and Pedek after having gone through what she had gone through in Midnight Tides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Kettle is kind of a beacon of a lot of internal thoughts for a lot of different characters uh, in the group. Like we find the POVs in the group thinking about Kettle quite a bit mm -hmm. and, and her innocence and her place in the group as a child. And uh, the one person who's really terrible to her is Ruin. Ruin's not, not yeah, really interesting. You know it's interesting because um, so I was looking at my notes right beforehand and I, I seem to remember this. It's going to be interesting to reread this book eventually because I don't really remember a lot of interactions between Ruin and Kettle. And then the end kind of caught me off guard. Mm. Uh, sorry to jump ahead, Thank but you. there was talk at one point where one of the characters, and I don't remember if it's Udinas or Serampedic was reflecting, I think after the fact that they had noticed that Kettle and ruin being being close to each other mm -hmm. for much yeah. of the journey and then slowly starting to to shift that relationship as he became came closer to using her to stabbing her yeah, yeah. Um, ruin's yeah. so cold compared to the mm -hmm. other to Andy, uh which is you know his brother rake like you know rake for all intents and purposes got along with the malazans pretty well memories of ice has the relationship with whiskey jack and stuff and ruin just came off the page to me totally different than his brother well, you have to keep in mind a couple things. One is that Silcus Ruin has been in an Azath for hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. That'll do it. <laughs> that would make you grumpy, Maybe. Um, I think. But aside from that, just prior to that, before he was betrayed by Scavendari Blood, I stabbed in the back, literally. Just prior to that, he had become a soul taken. And he had, uh, yeah. become, he has a, a, a draconic self that, mm -hmm. um, if you, you'll see that, um, there are elements of this in Anamander Rake as well, his brother, right? Um, mm -hmm. but Rake has been around all this time. This is a point that AP made long ago, and, and I, I still mm -hmm. remember it and appreciate it. Anamander Rake has been around, he's sort of rediscovered his humanity, as it were. Whereas Silcus Ruin hasn't had that opportunity. He's emerged. He's got, he's more draconic than 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 Tyst in some ways, and so he has this very cold reptilian thinking that you see on the page. Plus, I think he knew all along what he was going to do with Kettle. And oh, he so, definitely did. Yeah. That's yeah. That's what I was wondering too. If he's Absolutely. sort of having to play that role to oh, sort of. Knew. Yeah. Push yeah. through what I, he has to do. But he I didn't see he her as a, as a human being. He saw her as an Azath. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. And he knows he knows all about Azath. Yeah, exactly. He probably doesn't love being close to one that or something <laughs> he knows will turn into an Azath. Yeah. Um but there is talk in the book at one point, I believe, about her becoming more human hmm. over time. Mm-hmm. So I that's actually that... a pretty common theme in this book is people returning to their humanity. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. What you, but what you said, Philip, about him, you know, being trapped 
for <laughs> all that time? Because isn't there a part, I don't remember if this is in the prologue or if I'm imagining this, so please correct me if I'm wrong, about how Rake was kind of indifferent to... <laughs> yeah. so the Rake yeah. you saw yeah. in the prologue, the Rake you saw in the prologue was the more draconic Rake. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Who would have been much more like Silcus Ruin. You know, oh, very okay. cold and calculating. Yeah, and the world rake, had changed rake. Rake time. that you meet later in the Malazan Book of the Fallen has has become a much more he's a guy who can chill out and have wine with Baruch, you know. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. And I remember this because we I, I don't remember if it was in a discussion that you and AP had, but I remember talking about how Rake's name is a little bit different in this prologue, kind of uh -huh. showing the evolution over time. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's just interesting to take all that into consideration. Yeah. yeah, a lot of a lot of care has been put into these characters and the history that runs over hundreds of thousands of years. It's one of the reasons why I get slightly defensive when I hear people say, oh, hundreds of thousands of years, but none of it matters. And I'm like, I don't agree with that. Um, and I think it matters in the in the biggest parts uh, in our characters, the ones who actually have lived that long. Um, I think the history adds so much to this and there's always nuance to everything. Like I, in this book, we see the art of the Kachain Shamal and they, what the short tales versus the long tales. And they, there was a war there. And I think the short tales are more intellectual and it's like, okay, first off, <laughs> Erickson has already created the Kachain Shamal, which is one of my favorite things in all of fantasy. He could have just left it there. And he said, no, 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 that's not realistic. There would obviously be in tribe fighting. There would be a difference between cult. He created a culture for dinosaurs. I mean, like, this is so ridiculous, but it's awesome. Like, that's what, like, Erickson went the extra mile, and then he went the extra, extra mile after that. And I think that that's what makes Malazan such a unique experience, or at least a piece of what makes this such a unique experience. Um, yeah. Also, can we be honest? I know Ruin's kind of cold. He's a Chad, dude. I, I love <laughs> Ruin. He's a Chad. He literally, they're like, oh, no, Makra. He goes, Makra, never heard of it. I'll just go kill them all. It's fine. And he just goes and wipes all these people. And you're just like, what in the world? And then you have like the next scene, Hannon Mosag is talking crap. He's trying to go against Roulette on the throne. He's going to go find Ruin's group. And I'm like, you're an idiot, dude. If you cross paths with Ruin, you're done. You're oh, done, man. son. There's no I chance. I feel like Hannah Mosag is such a dis dis like diluted character. <laughs> yes. Just he actually, seems to think that. he's in so much more control than he actually yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. He, he is one of those people who doesn't realize he's in over his head because even the cripple God didn't want that smoke with ruin. Like even the cripple God was like ruin. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just back up a little bit. Uh, and then it just cuts to Hannah Mosag and he's like, Oh, I'm so smart. Yes, and, exactly. Like, yeah. You're, 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 you're not Uh planet six to eight says with rake and ruin stuff. I feel like reading forge of darkness at this point will only enhance the story. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you really want to understand all that, <laughs> you, you do need to go to the Carcanus trilogy. Yeah, two books so far. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and and this is actually uh, Philip's here only to plug. That's um, right. The other <laughs> novels, and <laughs> uh, knowing that Carcanus, especially after reading Toll the Hounds, I can't wait to go back. And when when does it fall into the timeline? The Carcanus trilogy. It's it's years. hundreds of thousands of years before. Oh, okay. Um, the last book of the Fallen. It's yeah. Long before. But what is a chat? So a chat is just like you know, he's just the dude. Like he's <laughs> it's like he's the man. He's got a strong jawline, nice fade, big muscles, nice delts. You got to have nice delts to be a chat. It, it's <laughs> really a, artwork of him. It's yeah. a stupid term, and it's probably insulting for me to use such a term talking about such good literature, but it's who I am. So uh, <laughs> kind of uh, wrapping up part one here, we see Jana, who's the Empress of Lethary, is now degrading. She was beautiful. She's falling apart. She's also the Queen of Chains. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also see the Menendor sisters uh, who are taking the cripple God side. And one of them is the mother of Hanon Mosag. This is a piece, by the way, as we go on, I don't understand the sister's purpose in the story as much as I had wished that I had. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sure I will miss something about them in the future. Uh, but part one ends with something that happens quite a few times in the series. Talk is back, baby. Talk the younger, talk answer, <laughs> whatever you want to call him. I love him so much. And it turns out that Red Mask is the first sort of the can change him out. We get that through his POV and that he's a human, which is wild. Uh, but talk was leading the gray swords. And we find out that Red Mask had m just murked the gray swords and done terrible things uh, to the gray swords. But talk is going to 
join sides because Red Mask wants to organize an army to fight the Lethery. Mm. I love talk, guys. I love it. <laughs> well, he's kind of an idiot at some points, but I really love talk. He must have been a really interesting character in <laughs> um, their gaming life. Is I think that Alan had that had suspected that. <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah, talks the I wild think, card. I think one of the ways in which Erickson builds a bit of sympathy for Red Mask is how Red Mask treats Talk. Mm -hmm. That he he uh, yes. Not only he kind of saves Talk, and because you like Talk, you kind of think, oh, well, this Red Mask chap, he's 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 all right. Um, he he helped Talk, so I kind of like him. And then you kind of you you're Red Mask is an interesting character because you're. You can see again the futility theme in, in him a lot, and, and it's it's so ironic that he turns out to be Lethary in the end, not yes. an owl, um, and how that whole thing was his sort of savior complex in a way. Um, but but that um, there are aspects of him that you really kind of you're rooting for. I mean, that's a tough battle when you're you're because Erickson has made me like aspects of red mask and talk is on their side but then i also kind of like the lefairy what was her name brevet uh bevet um Bivet, uh yeah yeah Bivet. Yeah. that yeah i like her and i like the tice eater who's with her the brawl? Uh, is that brawl yeah brawl or is, is that it, the wrong name Bruce and Trana, or is that the other oh, one no, it, oh no i, I have my book i should look it up Bruce and Trana, i believe is one of the yeah brawl handar sorry yeah yeah yeah, okay. handar. yeah. I like him. And so I'm, I'm rooting for different people in this battle on different sides of it. And then of course there's the one battle, which I'm sure we're going to talk about where they all get covered in mud and everybody's the same, you know? Yeah. There's which is very symbolic of what Erickson's trying to get across on the page. And also yeah. I think the ending point of red mask. That's um, so interesting to bring that up because I mean, just to look at those two things side by side, red mask and being covered in the mud, making everyone kind of the same. Be, and then taking off Red Mask's mask mm -hmm. and realizing he's not <laughs> that different, that he's a lethery. I don't know. I just think that's kind of interesting. To I mean, about. I get, you know, we could we could just talk about it now. I mean, kind of talking about it. But uh, one of the things that Erickson said that I found to be so interesting is that actually I'll just read it. This is what it, he, when he was asked about Red Mask, he said this. Uh, and this is only the first part of the quote. It's very, very long, but I just want to get this main piece out. Um, so if you want to see the rest of it, you can go check it out on tour.com uh, reread. But it says Red Mask. Ah, I knew this would be a problematic tale. Primarily, I suspect, because it ended so badly. Ended with virtually no sense of satisfaction. His identity makes absurd the notion of the other. Yeah. Of course, which was not accidental since it was the point I was trying to make. Reinforced with the final battle in the mud that left the combatants indistinguishable. If one were to consider themes here, then we might note that the idea that the risk always exists, that each side in a conflict becomes as bad as the other. The mm -hmm. atrocities slide back and forth between the sides that the ultimate pathetic idiocy, idiocy, I don't know. Idi uh, idiocy. Idiocy, yeah. thank you. Of said conflict is even if recognized insufficient to stop the madness. So it's the blurring of lines that eventually you lose yourself in all of this and everyone just becomes gross. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I mean, wow. I thought what a quote. And he has like three more paragraphs, by the way, where he talks about like the world at this time. It is a fascinating read. Um, but I love that paragraph. That's that's an excellent paragraph. Does that wow. not make and I know people say I hate Red Mask and, and that's fine. You have that right. But I loved Red Mask. I loved the whole thing. I even liked it before I really understood the, the themes behind it, because sometimes uh, you know, it doesn't matter what side you were on. It's about standing up for a cause and, and doing your thing, which which I think Red Mask was doing, even though he was Lethary, he was standing up for uh, the people who were kind of being taken over and oppressed. Right. Um, but yeah, what the Lethary were doing to the all was uh, horrible. It was a kind of genocide, you know, and they yeah. had done it to other people before. So totally, yeah. I mean, it's it's he's he's got some justice to his cause as well. Yeah. Yeah, and as we recap this, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep that in mind because, you know, we'll talk about uh, different strategies and stuff. But at the heart of it all, it's, you know, it's it's atrocities on both sides. People are dying and yeah. uh, it's it's very sad. Um, but on a brighter note, we start out part two with what I think is the best group in the book. And that's Quick Ben, Troll and Tool. That's uh -huh. like three of my favorite characters. So, I, it was, <laughs> you know, I was immediately in Cotillion assures uh, Quick Ben that Kalam is alive, which we already knew uh, at the end of the Bone Hunters. Uh, but he's hiding the reason why Shadow Throne saved Kalam and threw in the Azith. And 
it's just a common theme that we never know what the hell Shadow Throne's doing. And I feel like when I end the series, I'm going to look back and go, oh, it was obvious. I feel like that's going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, Joanna's just like, you have no idea. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I would like to take a minute and talk about how much we all hate Clip. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I hate Clip. Oh my. I hate Clip more than Alan hates traffic. Wow. Which is a lot. Wow. Well, and worse. I, I guess I'm going to try to be a clip apologist. Huh? Uh, here we are. I know. Oh, no. <laughs> Give it a shot. <laughs> Give it a shot. I'll try. Go I will Go try. It. It, it's, it goes against my nature, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so picture this you've been abandoned by your father, and everybody you know that, that you grew up with is wiped out. What kind of uh, mood are you going to be in at, at that point? You, you're you're angry at your father, right? For for not being there, for abandoning. For, you've perceived that he hasn't been around all your life, and that, and the moment of crisis, he didn't come to help, and everybody you loved has has been wiped out. I mean, that's the situation that Clip is in. So, and he's like a okay, he's a Tyst Andy, so he's probably much older than I'm thinking, but he is. Um, He's adrift and he, he is, he is from his perspective, he's trying to get some justice for all of these horrible things that have happened. So yeah. he believes that he's in the right. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there, that's to bear in mind. Now he is obnoxious and he is absolutely not my favorite character <laughs> in the series or even in the book or even a character that I enjoy being around. But <laughs> I think you have to keep those things in mind um, that, that he is um, he's somebody who's experienced a lot of loss and, and, and grief. And, and that when you're younger, a lot of times when you go through stuff like that, you kind of act out, you kind of act like a jerk when, when you've been hurt. Yeah. Um, so so there is that, you know, I think we have to bear that in mind. And, and a lot of people glorify Rake still. Like he's still that guy, you know, I mean, he's, he's very revered and whatnot. So I feel like <laughs> Rupert says, even with all that, Philip is saying, true, <laughs> Rupert's still a total dick. I tried, I tried Rupert. I really tried. Close yeah. the defensive clip. He has daddy issues. I mean, that's fair. I mean, they're real yeah. issues, right? Are there yeah. any side novels, by the way, that we should read to like clip? Or yes, Jared said what? <laughs> what side novel should we <laughs> read? Back to like Jared's clip? question. Oh, I don't think there are any. Um, <laughs> you you have to read the next book, of course, Toll the Hounds. I think, yeah. but um, I'm not sure you're going to like him anymore as a result of that. So mm. yeah, <laughs> and probably Eric, not. Eric has a good point. It isn't clear that Rake even knows knew there of their existence. Yeah, Rake is very like kind of detached. From the Andy, which we see a lot of that in Toll the Hounds, obviously. Um, or if he knew of their existence, would they have been better off being left alone? That's another question as well, I think. Maybe it's a mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some quick notes. Uh, we see the fact that Feather Witch and Hannah Mosag are working together, and it's like a whole other layer. They're kind of going away from the crippled god because Hannah Mosag was burned in Midnight Tides by him. We see Fenner in Eret's Temple saying that the last battle draws near, which I thought was crazy. We also tend, uh, we get that the Grey Swords had uh, their hearts eaten out by the All. Uh, and this is where Red Mask is upset with them and wishes that they would have just captured the Grey Swords and not done that. Um, one cool thing I wanted to talk about here, though, is we see Feather Witch and she gathered up a finger in Midnight Tides. And it's like one line at the end of Midnight Tides. And I remember like thinking in my head, like, remember this, James, you're going to need this. And it turns <laughs> out it's a huge detail. Uh, the ghost of Kora Khan tells her to wait for his instructions before using that finger that she collected, which I believe is Bryce's, right? Or Briss? Yeah, it's Breeze Bedicks. Breeze Bedicks, yes. I forgot about that. It's yeah. it's a throw. It's literally one line. It's yeah. one line. And it. I just remember when I read it, it just a light bulb. I said, yep, that's going to matter. Like, why did this person run into the middle of the scene just to pick up a finger? That's strange. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that I was, uh, pay, I, I had a payoff for that, which Erickson doesn't waste any lines, in my opinion, mm -hmm. which is impressive considering how long the books are. Yeah. Um, couple of questions in the chat there one is rake his literal dad no uh i don't think so that's just yeah, the oh, tice yeah. andy familial relationships are all just sort of 
big father, you know, cousin, whatever. They're all confused. Uh, you've been, you, you stick around for a few hundred thousand years. That happens, I guess. So I'm really embarrassed to admit that I didn't realize that <laughs> until uh, I heard you talk about it for Toll the Hounds. I just, I, I thought their relationships were more. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But then I felt kind of. Well, sometimes confused. they are. Sometimes they are, but most of the time they're not. I think. Yeah. yeah. Which is sense. also correct about the wolves eating the hearts. Yes, that's correct. Gray yeah. swords. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, my notes aren't always accurate, folks. I try. I try. I try my my damn just though. Um, so Karos captured Nassau. I hope I'm saying that right, Nassau, uh, for questioning and ends up stabbing her to death. Mm -hmm. and um i didn't understand i actually said this maybe you guys could explain i didn't understand why he snapped at this moment i didn't know if like that had been like kind of in tune with his character i am very murky on almost all the patriotist well he, he right. realized that uh Bruce and trauma was coming and he wanted to kill her because he realized that he was going to rescue her and so he he killed her okay. in order to prevent that rescue and to, to thwart him. Um, so, yeah. And then I pays for it immediately because Bruthen whooped his ass. And oh, it was yeah. so satisfying. It wasn't she pregnant? Am I right about that? I, I believe yeah. so. That's correct. Sad. Good yeah. Lord. But Bruthen, I mean, he's he's got the typical arrogance of the Tice Edor as well, though. And he, he should have understood that the, you don't leave a snake like this, you know, no. wiggling at your feet. Um, because, and he does the same thing with the... Um, Tribunal, you know, yep. he, he he has a chance to, you know, <laughs> get um, rid of these two and yeah. he just assumes that, that he's in control after he beats him up a bit, you know. Well, it's interesting because like mercy and compassion and forgiveness is a huge theme in this series. And this is an instance where mercy is actually maybe not the best option. And I'm not even sure it's mercy in his case. I think it was more arrogance, but yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? I actually would agree with that. I don't know if it was, it was certainly not out of the goodness of his heart. You're I don't actually, think so. Yeah. You're right. You're right. So maybe mm -hmm. that that's the difference. Um, we get a lot from the errant in this book. I gotta be honest. I, I know, uh, like Alan does. I don't think Alan likes the errant. At he all. doesn't. I, I've seen other people <laughs> hate the errant. I love a lot of what we get. Uh, in part two, Aaron goes to get Feather Witch's blood. When he stabs her, she is able to stab Aaron in the eye with yeah. Bris, uh, Bryce's fingers and, or finger. And then she eats his eyeball. And it would appear <laughs> that the Feather Witch and Aaron are now bound, which I did not see coming. Uh, Aaron's not happy about it. Feather Witch says Aaron must now choose a mortal sword and it should be Udinas. And we also had an interesting tidbit here about the Master of Tiles versus Deck, meaning Aaron versus Ganos. Hmm. And I mean, I, I love the Aaron. I think it's a very inner Aaron's a fascinating character and Ganos is one of my favorite characters. So I was kind of interested to see the setup between master of tiles against deck. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're yeah. taking great notes, Jimmy. That's amazing. Some of these notes are good. Some of them are literally uh, like <laughs> some of them are <laughs> ruin goes. <laughs> like my just, notes are a mess. <laughs> I have so many notes, but I can't really, I mean, you have them just, completely boiled down so well i prepared for this live stream with a three and a half hour study session today so wow. I, uh, I put a lot of time into these but i don't mind it's not i love this i, I yeah really, and i feel comfortable like i don't know why everyone's always so kind in chat uh and i feel like i always end up i don't know i love this stuff um i've always found that too honestly i uh, when i started getting into malazan the the fans were all so nice yes so, yeah, yeah they get a bad rap i think um and, and you know some people say well you've been so positive i've been negative on things i've been negative on plenty of things and alan's also been on this channel and ranted about things he didn't like and everyone was very responsive and kind also alan's delivery is unmatchable yeah. in my opinion <laughs> i think he's just the best when it comes to entertainment and also like getting across his points um, but i've had nothing but a good time like i'm actually way less nervous for these than i used to be i'm very relaxed now um yeah. Yeah. yeah gonna, and I try to cherish these because I'm going to miss when the first 10 are gone. I'm going to keep reading though. So we'll, we'll be back together even after the 10. You have to let me know which books you're going to read on after this and maybe I'll follow along with you. That'd be awesome. I yeah. Would love that. Because I'd I'm love to read on, but I felt like for me, like I love what you're doing here. I felt kind of lonely <laughs> reading the last few books and not really having anybody to talk to. So it'd be fun to read alongside you. Yeah, that would be excellent. Not about some of the other books. So. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll join us for eight, nine, and 10, especially oh, since we're so fresh in oh, your mind. Oh, so. you're kidding. I'm so honored to be here anytime. Thank you. <laughs> well, 
so fun. I have uh, asked for help on this one, so you two have to help me here. Uh, Karu Khan, if I'm saying that right, goes to fetch mm -hmm. Samar Dev to heal Feather Witch, but Samar traps him in her knife. I didn't understand why she did this. Well, so for one thing, she doesn't know what, what he's trying to accomplish. She doesn't know what his motives are. And okay, he's also trying to gather power in that knife because she knows she's going to need it because uh, a lot of big things are going down. So picture yourself, you're, you're about to, you're witnessing the apocalypse and there's a couple, you know, weapons at hand and you're trying to survive this. Uh, so she's just kind of grabbing what she can, I think there. And she knows this is a very powerful spirit because he was obviously very powerful. He's the Sita, you know, he was very powerful in life. So, so I think that's the, I don't think she understood exactly what he was trying to accomplish in the first place. So it's unfortunate in a way, because obviously if he had been able to succeed, then things would have turned out a little differently. So yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And, and she, and Samar Dev is very smart. So she probably wanted to be very. prepared for the Samar Dev's phenomenal. Love, love Samar. Uh, isn't she fantastic? She's so good. What a good character. You know, Erickson does not, in my opinion, get uh, enough credit. Like when people talk about Malazan, I don't think they talk so much about how amazing some of these female characters. Oh, are. they're, they're brilliant. My, some of my favorite female characters are in this series. I but even if you think about this book alone, like Sarah and Pettick and yeah. with Janeth and with uh, Samar Dev, just brilliant. And they're powerful. Women. Yeah. They're, they're powerful. And it's not in spite of itself. Like it's, this is how this world is. I, I mean. Yeah. And it's not powerful in the generic way that yeah. you see a lot of fantasy. <laughs> and I'm not I'm saying of one. writers, but you know how some writers will try to write strong women and they're just. Uh, very one-dimensional, I'm very manly, kind of strong. Um, but these women are feminine and strong in different ways and flawed too. And I think that that just adds more dimension to them. I felt they were so relatable. Um, mm -hmm. I think, like I said, my favorite is uh, Serenpedic because yeah. I just, I feel like I understand her mind so well. And to me, it's just, I can see how she sees herself and how seeing her from the outside, it's like, on one hand, I can empathize with how she's seeing herself and validate how that is so true from her perspective. But then reading about her, I could see that she's not as bad or as horrible as she thinks she is. Mm -hmm. And that's probably true about Udinos too, and some of the other characters, and maybe even um, with Beak as well. But it's just amazing the way the depth that uh, these characters have. Yeah. yeah, they really do. I'm our dev too. I mean, who else could stand up to Carsa that way? Yeah. You know? I mean, and the way she allows, she stands up to him, but she also takes in what he has to say. Oh, she's, she's fascinated by him and terrified all at once. You know, because, yeah. you know, she, she is a witch uh, and she's mm -hmm. very smart and she works with all these things. She's almost a scientist and an inventor, right? So I feel like she's almost doing a case study on Carsa and trying to figure out his inner workings. And totally. Yeah, yeah. That's how her brain works. She's an engineer. Yeah, their, their, their dynamic is interesting on a personal level, but they, I also love how they represent this ongoing argument about the pros and cons of civilization versus uh, barbarism or, yes. or primitive state of, of, of primitive in air quotes there yeah. of, of, of living because Carsa really surprises her sometimes with his insights about just how the corruption of civilization and what it does. And, and he wants to wipe it all out. And you, there are moments when I'm like, yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah. hey, some days, some days, man, <laughs> let me yeah. tell you, I, uh, I don't disagree. And the, th the thing about Sam Ardev is she comes to the conclusion that, Oh, Carsa can, he can wipe out. She believes in him. It's scary. Yeah. yeah. He's terrifying. He's so awesome. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just love their relationship so much, especially at the end. I think that line, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead, but just that line where he, he needs her to witness what's happening with, he says, I need you to be my witness and you teach me about women. And oh, there's just so many beautiful moments between those two. Yeah. And there's a moment in Toll the Hounds that I have in big, bold letters. I can't wait to do uh, and talk about. Mm, yay. So good. Um, okay. So, Hannah Mosag wants to abandon the idea of chaos since Rula had ruined that for him. Uh, and he essentially says that he will make an agreement to have the eater back him and also wants to get Bryce as his mortal sword. While this is happening, Trana brutally assaults Feather Witch and takes Bryce's finger and then leaves. 
And this is an interesting thing because Feather Witch, in my opinion, has been pretty dislikable for most of the time she's been on page. But Trana, I mean, it's brutal. It's it's pretty hardcore. And I f start to feel bad for Feather Witch in a lot of ways. Um, and Hannah Mosag also becomes kind of sympathetic in this book towards the end. And I think this was kind of the beginning where you see he's really just trying to save his people. Yep, yeah, he, really is. he I doesn't. Guess, I guess so. <laughs> he's well. He's trying to save yeah. the culture, uh, and, and yeah. he and like he's seeing the lethary and, and influence on the uh, Idor and stuff. And I don't know. I'm not saying that I, you know, I'm gonna give him my jacket off my back, but I can start to see where he's coming from from a different um, way. Yeah, feather witch in that finger. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty gross. Yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> it's really. Uh, I do remember that just because I remember it's gross, but I I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> the greater significance of that. So well, and how she dies too is really oh. I mean, oh, it's brutal. He's in the water; her skin is peeling. I could feel oh, it. Yeah. I could yeah. feel it. It was brutal. Yeah. Um, one of the things I got confused about, and I'm wondering if anyone in chat also felt this way. Um, quick, Ben Troll and Onrak jump through a portal of some sort, and Onrak in this moment returns to life. Uh, it's a beautiful moment because Troll's like crying for his friend. I got a little choked up. Really something. Uh, one of the many th times in this book that I felt a lump in my throat. But I didn't understand this portal. And I think I remember, is this Corald, um This is this is a warren, right? Am I am I right? Are you talking about the refugium now? Is that where we're Yes, going? the refugium. Is that how you said refugium? I don't, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's what they jumped into here. This is the portal to the refugium. And, yeah. and, and this is where Onrek comes back to life. This okay. is also where the other Tlanamas came alive briefly before she was blown up by hedge right because yes. she had come there to corrupt this place um as the others uh, who had preceded her had, had come but it, it is a it is a um a little pocket warren where the talan amas can become imas again yeah and, and so it, it is that i mean it's well named the refugium there are a few beautiful things happen there of course also um, eventually, in, in addition to the really beautiful uh, thing going on with, um, you know, um, Onrak returning to his humanity so and, and the, uh, just the, the wonder as he, he, he touches things and he's back in nature and, and, and his friends witnessing it and, and giving us the sense, because we know how to feel about this because we're watching Quick Ben's reaction. We're watching. Control. Oh yes, I do remember this. It's yeah, so lovely. The other beautiful, beautiful thing that happens in the refugium is is um, when Udinas is united with his son. Um, yes, he had all that pain of he was trying to be a father figure to Kettle, mm. and you know how that worked out. But um, but <laughs> when he um, when he's united with his son, particularly at the end, because we're jumping way ahead here, but um, particularly at the end. Yeah, I, I that's that's possible, Mitch. I'm not sure. I, uh, I believe that is correct. I believe Hedge also oh, returns to life. Is I mean, that it's, why? Yes, because of the refugium. Oh, yes, that's I, possible. I, I, I actually that was a question I've always kind of had. <laughs> no, <laughs> never really understood. But the it. the moment when they're watching the, the what, are they, what are they called? They're like bison like creatures. Um, and there's a young oh, one. Um, the, veteran. Rana or Rana? Or is that what they? I can't remember what is they it are. The, is it veteran or am I thinking of something it's else? It's either a Ranag or veteran, one or the other. Oh, one okay. of these yeah. made up animals. But they're like bison. And there's one that's a young one that's been separated. Oh, and yeah. you can you see Udinas is, of course, he's got such a, a tender heart. And, and he's lamenting for this young creature. Uh, oh. And ultimately, though, it, it's this wonderful symbolic moment because the creature is united with its family, just as he and his son have been brought together. And this it is just such a perfect, beautiful moment. So I, I think we have to acknowledge these wonderful, beautiful parts as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree. Also, it's interesting you bring this up because in Toll the Hounds, there's also a scene that I won't get into here, but uh, it seems like animals and, and people actually have very mirrored moments at times um, mm -hmm. in this series. And I think that that's definitely maybe Whoa. something Erickson's trying to yes. get across. I think you're on. I think you're right about that. <laughs> and I specifically am also thinking about this because in the Q and a session, he was talking about the grief of losing a pet and how um, some would say that losing a loved one and a pet is, is very different, but he believes that grief in, in any form in the moment is the most realistic emotion. Uh, and I thought it was really beautiful the way he said it. And he said, basically, both are valid. 
and that the extremity of it uh, doesn't really matter in the moment of it. Uh, they're both crushing and collapsing and, uh, and and tough to get through. But I've noticed that like you said that, Philip, and I'm thinking about this Toll the Hound scene. And there's a lot of like like people coming together or something happened with humans. And then all of a sudden we see the uh, the wildlife also mirroring what we're seeing, um, yeah. which I would assume if I could ask Erickson that that is probably very, very intentional like most things in Malazan. <laughs> that is interesting. That's an interesting insight. There we go, Jonna. That's what we'll look for in our reread. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's so much there. When you know, with a lot of these things, like, you know, for example, Hedge coming back to life, it's like, I did wonder, okay, why? <laughs> How? And, but like, there are so many things that happen in this series as a first time reader that you kind of just, okay, I'll just go with that. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> we'll vibes. Just go with that and yeah. sing, you know, because if you stop and try to under, you know, you're just going to drive yourself crazy. And <laughs> how about the, the wonderful, I mean, Reaper's Gale, the book is called, and there's that wind. Mm. It, the wind it, element is so common. It's all over movie. the place. Yeah. But I love that the wind in, in Hood's realm, it is Hood's sort of voice there as Hedge is going through, you know, this whole place. Uh, that's really cool. Oh, was that so that was hood because i actually have uh like there's this whole i have actually have this quote here the wind told him as much it had been his companion for so long now he had grown accustomed to its easy revelations its quiet rasp of secrets and its caressing embrace when he stumbled onto a scatter of enormous bones hinting at some unhuman monstrous god of long ago the wind as it slipped down among those bones, seeped between jutting ribs and sl slithered through orbitals and into the hollow caves of skulls, moaned that God's once holy name, names. And I don't know, it just goes on from there. But let's go. It's so beautiful. I just, I love these Man. passages. Talk about talented. Excellent prose. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, at his top of the game, I mean, it's hard to beat. Uh, it's hard to beat it. Oh. His breath, yeah. Hood's yeah. breath, my God! Wow. Um, it, also, in this section, we get the 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 all versus the all and Lethry battle with the Kinshane Shamal are really on page, like big time, oh, and yeah. the impact through the text is horrifying. I felt every moment of it, and they're in the valley where the uh, ritual of Talon was performed. So no magic works, and it's this big strategy. Doesn't go super well doesn't go terrible but there's a lot of withdrawing and and people not doing their jobs and ruining the game plan and it's just it's a massacre on both sides really yeah. yes and i think that i mean if i'm thinking of the same place in the book it seemed like there was um some discussion between Brol handar and uh bivat and how mm -hmm. you know it's just interesting because she's lethry and he's tistador they're working together and it's sort of awkward the way they're working together for this mission to yep. <laughs> to take over this land from these tribes and from the all. And uh, so it's not a, you know, it's not a virtuous mission by any means, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because they were once enemies, but they're working mm -hmm. together on this. And I know he's kind of telling her it, that she's, you know, I, I think he's kind of warning her this might not work. And she's so sure of herself. And then things don't go well. <laughs> um, that's I like, that memories like that. She the whole time is saving his life. Yes, I love yeah. that. assassins yes. after mm -hmm. him the yep. whole time. And so that that's another part of the dynamic because she can't tell him certain things, and and she is trying to protect him. And I mean, it's just so ironic the whole time. Some of the stuff he says, not knowing that she has sent somebody there to protect him all this time, you know. So it's it's really interesting dynamic between them. Yeah. Now, was yeah. that at that scene, or did that happen after that scene? I just know they died together, right? For yes. The, the battle together. Yeah. I feel like there's another battle after this they died in, but I okay, might. Yeah, be wrong. that's the one. Okay. I might mm -hmm. be wrong. Yeah, that's the one where she reveals that I could think there were like nine or ten assassins after him. And right. she's this other that's person later. to go and intersect each of these assassins. When that started happening, because there was a scene where you see that kind of happening, and it's a little confusing. And then later on, you figured, at least I figured it out, like, oh, that's what's happening. Yeah. And uh, and he asks, Brolhandar asks, if he can go into battle side by side with that person mm. who has protected him. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's just so it's, it's so cool. meaningful. Yeah, it's definitely one of the those frontline moments that we get um, from being a military fantasy that you're not going to get in a lot of other series and in the inspection of like camaraderie um, and respect. It's it's so good. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's just so messed up too that Brawl Hendar was being used like that. I guess so. I think from what I understand, they were they sent him out there because they saw him as a threat being in dream. Yes, yeah. They wanted him dead yeah. for sure. They wanted him dead. Yeah. 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 But speaking of camaraderie and, and all that, um, we're going to talk about the Malazans, aren't We've we? We've got to talk well, about the Malazans. Oh, we're definitely going to. Um, so the ending of part two, um, mm -hmm. before we get to the Malazans arriving, uh, the shake is, is mentioned. And I want to bring this up because I thought they were really interesting. And I'm not really sure what the end goal here. I'm hoping that it pops maybe back up in another future book. But uh, the shake is a coven of witches. And it's pretty interesting. Uh, I felt like I was missing some details, but it seems Twilight is now their queen and her half brother is called the watch. Not sure why uh, there are 200 of them and they seem powerful as hell. And they're through being with the Lethers and the Adore. They don't care about either. They want to stand on their own, which is just another chess piece that we have to think about uh, in this grand <laughs> scheme of things. Um, and yeah. the Malazans have arrived at the end of part two. Yeah. Uh, so Jimmy, if you want to fully understand the shake, uh, sorry to say this, but you got to read Carcanus. <laughs> Let's go. You got to read Carcanus if you want to know what all that stuff is. But you will know a lot more when you get to the end of the series. Uh, awesome. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm all that stuff. The Watch and um, and uh, <laughs> Twilight. All that stuff goes way back. Never read it. The 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 Twilight. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it goes way back. I mean, they they are they have Tyst blood in them as well. They've been in, you know intermixed all these years uh, with with the people. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So hey, there's Alan. There's there's the guy who you, you were supposed. Alan! to. We've been talking about you and Red Mask. <laughs> are you surprised? Be, uh, pushing for Red Mask. We already talked about him, so you're too late. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alan, I'll send you an invite right now. You just, you just let me know. Uh, <laughs> we'll go into uh, part three here. Uh, and this is a Lestara quote that I really enjoyed. And it says, because uh, now we're, we have the Malazans, right? Um, Remain a soldier, Lestara, Yale told herself. A statement that whispered through her mind a hundred times a day. Remain a soldier. All the rest will go away. Which is beautiful rhyming. Uh, very interesting to see her running from her trauma and her grief. Uh, by being super dedicated to a cause. It's something I can very much relate to. Um, yeah. I, I, I felt... wrote that quote down actually in my notes too. Yeah. Oh, it's it's an absolute beautiful quote. Oh, Alan's on break from Gloomhaven. Thanks for the invite. Uh, no. I, I do really, <laughs> I really do love that. I, and I, I mean, just I'm just kind of making up ideas and assumptions here because I've never been in the military but just from what I've heard of other people who've been in the military and just reading a series like this, it just brings to mind how, how you can find your purpose. I think one of the things about military life is it seems like what you do matters, not only for yourself, but for the people around you to yeah. a much greater degree yeah. than in civilized life or, you know what I mean? And not civilian life, if I should put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, that's true. I, I grew up an army brat, um, so I have a oh. kind of I, grew, I have a kind of perspective on that. But I also will say, as as a as a college professor, I have students who were, especially at a community college, uh, who are who are coming out of the military, and they are some of my very best students. They yes. just have so much discipline, and they are so respectful, and they know why they're there. And a lot of times, they will tell me. I was a bonehead when I got out of high school mm -hmm. and uh, you know, being in the military is why I have this discipline now. And this is why I, I, I understand what I'm doing now. So it really, it really taught them a lot. So, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. I, I know I actually have had some friends that were maybe a little on the clip side when they were younger uh -huh. and they went into the military because nothing else was going to help them grow up. And wow, it really helped them grow up. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but you yeah. go in clip really and turn sense. out a hedge, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And uh, th these are the things that, like, I never thought military fantasy would be something I'm interested in. And I still don't know. I don't know if it's just the Erickson brand that, I, that I'm, you know, Same loving. Here. Very yeah. curious to see how other military fantasy will go for me after Malazan. But I, I hope it goes well, because I, I love things like Band of Brothers, which I always use that 
tagline that Iskar told me, you know, Malazan's band of brothers. I, I think that that is a fairly good representation of at least a, uh, a face of the series. Um, there's obviously a ton more here as well, but uh, I think that's a pretty good selling point for a lot of people. Um, oh, someone said, uh, Oso said, I'm uh, sad I missed the Red Mask discussion. His whole plotline left a weird taste in my mouth, being tragic, being Native American, but no spoilers. I found it redeemed myself in the last two. Okay, cool. Um, we'll actually, uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about Red Mask a little bit more, um, but I wanted to talk about Tavor because Tavor, I actually have this here. Tavor is now my favorite character. And it's funny because yeah. Tavor, <laughs> Tavor becomes my favorite character from other people's perspectives and their POV chapters. You've um, made my day, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I now to be fair, I say a lot of people are my favorite character in this yeah, series because there's so many. <laughs> so you know, it's the flavor of the week. But I think uh, this one is going to stick, Jimmy. I, I do, especially after hearing Erickson talk about it. And whenever he was talking about how he would do an adaptation and he said Tavor would be one of the main lines that he would follow. I thought that was very telling of where he puts her in, in this narrative. Um, and we get ballistic pondering Tavor and her actions. And it poses a lot of questions about Tavor, but also the army in general and why they're there. Um, but Tavor gives that a rousing speech here. And it was the unwitnessed, epic. The unwitnessed uh, speech. Yeah. Oh, the bone hunters are now independent of the Malazan empire and Tavor. Oh, that speech ruled. I loved it. Um, and her and she immediately follows it up with burning the ships. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> why are you burning the ships? That's perplexing. Uh, what? Why would you do that? So it's funny. I get this moment where I'm like, that's my like, that's the one. She's the girl. She's the she's the best. And then she just does something super odd. And that, isn't that Tavor? Like so mysterious. Yeah. Her, her actions probably can be debated uh, all throughout the series of what her motivations were and what information she had. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. It's interesting in this book because it seems like, uh, and Philip, feel free to correct me for anything I say <laughs> that's completely off base. But I mean, it seems like she made a huge miscalculation in this book. <laughs> um, well, in, in terms of the Malazan invasion. Yeah, that's what I'm talking the about. The huge miscalculation was that the Leveri wanted to be free of right. Ice Edor. Yes. yes. Uh, and it's so it, hard it was a miscalculation. Absolutely. Yeah. She's, she's yeah, not she perfect. screwed up big time. And yeah. it's so, um, it's challenging because in this book, you're seeing her again. I mean, you see this throughout the series, but you're seeing her through Ballistic's yeah. pers perspective and Kenneb's perspective yeah. and Lestara's perspective. Yeah. And just, they're kind of questioning this, what, you know, unwitnessed, what the heck is she talking about? And you see them even kind of uphold Hellion higher than. Higher well, than thank Hellion. goodness for Hellion because at her tavern tour, you know, she figured out would, you know, what uh, would work, which is you, you don't want to <laughs> free, you don't want to free the Leveri from the Tice Edor. You want to free them from their, oppressive hierarchy that makes permanent slaves out of, you know, whole yeah. bloodlines and, and you know, all that indebted business. So that's what, what worked, you know, better than, uh, you know, trying to oppose th themselves to the Tice Edor. So, because yeah. the Tice Edor had just already been enveloped into that hierarchy, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. It's just crazy the way that worked out, how they yeah. actually like the Lethary were so satisfied with how things worked out like that. Yeah. Um, and it's, well, yeah. yeah, I'm always thinking back to that quote about how they worship an empty throne. And it's, and to me, it seems like Rulad is kind of the embodiment of emptiness in some way, because wow, yeah. this is just a broken, broken man. I know I use that word a lot, but no, <laughs> no, that's a mean. great parallel to draw. I think. Yeah. Futility um, once again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jared, I thought it was rousing because I'm very much a like, let's face the circumstances type thing. Um, I felt like she spoke with confidence. So I found it rousing. It might not be rousing for the soldiers that are throwing their lives away or, or well, Blistig you know. had his doubts. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, that, and that's what I want to point out here. I got kind of challenged here. How is burning the ships odd? In my opinion, the message is quite clear. It, the message is clear, but Blistig himself in this perspective is doubting her. So yes. that's kind of what I said you know, finding it odd through Ballistic's perspective. He, he well, is not super confident. And and I can sort of, um, you know, as much as I love Tavor and as much as I want to hate on Ballistic for doubting her, um, at the same time, it's kind of understandable because she's not really, she's not being upfront about certain things, it seems like. And she's not, 
Um, I mean, she's not an open person. We'll just put it that way. Yeah, and she's not a very open person. And she's and she uh, she hasn't really proved herself, uh, proven herself yeah. in any sort of. I, I mean, I guess you could say she did kind of prove herself at the end of Bone Hunters by uh, taking off and <laughs> in a way. Uh, but I, I, you know, it it's sort of like she. I know that actually Pete from Ponderings with Pete, he's the one who brought up actually in a discussion that I had with him. And with Philip and with Alan, right after reading this particular book, he said that what's interesting about that speech is that Tavor herself is unwitnessed. She's been unwitnessed hmm. throughout this entire series. We really haven't seen what she's capable of. We just know there's something there. And they're kind of having to go off faith. And there's even talk about faith among the soldiers at some point in this book. Yeah. And um, and it, I mean, because like even with even going back to house of chains when they had the battle with the whirlwind it, a lot of that came down to uh to coltane's tribes i think and to the ghosts of the land coming up and helping Wiccans, out yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it seems like at, in a way they are having to go off faith and blistic is a little cynical about that i mean they all are a little bit yeah Oh, definitely. And, and also ballistic isn't the only one question. Cause we no. immediately see Kenneb. Kenneb is like, uh, was our plan to start a civil war here and then come and invade? Like, was this all part of the plan? Um, which by the way, there's a really interesting theory out there that this is all because of the era sale. And, uh, I would have to read it, but it's fascinating. And, and Steven Erickson actually commented on this question that, po that gave this theory, um, and said, Hmm. Like interesting. Kind of like uh, I almost felt like he was acknowledging it in some ways. Um, maybe I'll pull it up if we have time at the end, because mm -hmm. I thought Aerosol are obviously fascinating and very, very nebulous. Um, but I'll see if I can pull that at the end. A lot of people are saying burning the ships is a way to make your men fight harder. Um, it's actually been done in history before. It also uh, does not leave ships for the other people to um, if they were to fail to build a navy. I mean, these are all fair points, but even her generals, very experienced generals are questioning her. So maybe they should have more trust in her. Maybe that's the the real lesson here. Mm -hmm. um, but we see some major uh, level ups and we can talk about Beak. Uh, Beak is a loose cannon with his flame in the dark and Sin is essentially holding back the undoing of the entire Jag Hut sorcery. And wow. with that bottle is back. So like magic is at the forefront here. Yes. I forgot. I I kind of have forgotten at this point Sin's role in this book. I know she has a role. Can you remind me what what she does in this book? She holds back the ice when they're on that island. Um, and it's melting. Oh. It's yeah. It's it's the whole. It has a lot to do with the jagged and and all of that stuff. But um, oh, she single handedly is holding back this giant wall of ice that is basically you know going to collide with everything. Um, so yeah, she's just got a lot of crazy amount of power there wow yeah yeah sin sin's actually like low-key super super strong um and there's a question from mitch says is Beak the only mage we know that can access all warns can quick do it because uh, of i think quick, quick ben can access a lot of warns yeah. whether or not he can do them all i'm not yeah he, he's in the ballpark sure, but he's yeah he's near there yeah um yeah. So maybe, uh, yeah, but, uh, 13. 13. Yeah. Eric, that you might be right there. Um, but yeah. Jay Rook says, uh, I read this 12 year old. I remember is that I loved it. Yeah. Uh, I read it a month ago and all I can remember is that I, yeah. this. I, I, I love the power between all the different mages. You know, you see sin's power, you see beaks power, you see bottles power in the series. You see, we well, started going the, the one, two, three, but three beats two somehow. So can three beat one? No, it's like that. We call it MMA math and mixed martial arts. It's where like you can't just look at who's beat who and it's fun. It's, it's but it's also, you know, how they survive this because of Makra, you know, they, and all various yes. mages, unnamed who are keeping them from being discovered, who are helping them in these moments when the uh, Lothari and the Tice Edor are about to get them. Uh, so there's a lot of unsung heroes along the way, uh, but these mages who come become like bottle exhausted trying to you know keep this uh, makra up, and uh, so there's a lot of that too, I think. Uh, and of course, there's a contrast between the Malazan's understanding of magic and the Latheri understanding because That's right. 
the Lethari continent has been frozen and, and literally and metaphorically. So magic didn't evolve there the same way it did in the rest of the Malazi world. So you had, that's the difference between the Warrens and the Holds essentially mm -hmm. is it the more primitive magic you have on the Lethari continent. Um, and it's more blunt and it's just kind of more, you know, big, whereas the, the, the Malazan mages, are a bit more subtle and and have uh you know ability to fine tune things a bit you know so so it's more of like a raw power would you say in the left yeah. continent that's a great way to put it yes yeah, yeah. yeah that's kind of how i understood it as well the little bit that i actually <laughs> uh did um also says i like how bottle use magic more strategically subtly yeah it feels like bottles a little bit more experienced um in a soldier at heart um so we'll, we'll touch on this real quick I thought that seeing the state of Rulad through Aaron's POV was really sad. Mm. Um, oh. He's decaying so fast uh, and Aaron takes pity on him. And, and in a lot of ways, it tells us a good amount about Aaron, even though his job in this book is, is to eventually break our hearts at the end. Um, I don't know. Maybe kind of like Aaron a little bit yeah. um, because of his empathy for Rulad. I think it's also worth comparing Rulad to Clip in a way. They're they're hmm. they're both young and, wow. and in a way and, and arrogant and get themselves into situations because of that arrogance and and poor you know Rulad who's uh, yeah. I I feel more sorry for him than anything because he's in over his way over his head and yes he makes some really dumb stupid arrogant decisions but he's also being used he's being exploited uh, yeah. ultimately by the crippled god of course uh, but um but yeah you know, it, his fate is is much worse than he, uh, you know he deserves i think i would agree with that my heart broke for rulad in midnight tides already um especially when he asks for fear's forgiveness and that yeah. scene but this book i just it just broke my heart even more just seeing how how much he was suffering he just wanted to die he yeah. wanted to die the ultimate death and it just was so heartbreaking and he can't seem to escape making just the worst decisions ever uh which at the end of this part we see that his parents are dead in the dungeons because he's led to believe that they are scheming against him um and it's like they die off screen in a flood and like you just know they're dead from dr i mean it's really rough and uh roulad is distraught but you're also like, dude, you did it. It's it's tough. But it's also really there's tough. the relationship with Troll. And you know that yeah. what Rula did to Troll That's right. is something that haunts him. And he all along really wanted Troll's approval. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's something yeah. just so heartbreaking about that. Oh, man. That is heartbreaking. Yeah. Isn't it crazy? Like House of Chains, Midnight Tides, and then Reaper's Gale. Like all those prologues. Uh, kind of tell a story you know it's it's hmm. it's interesting to think about all of these like uh i'll just use the the metaphor chains because it just seems appropriate in malazan but you know yeah. just all of the chains of guilt because you know as you mentioned uh rolad wanting trolls approval and then meanwhile fear is feeling guilt over what he did to abandoning Rulad and at the same time um, blaming Udinas and just this whole, I don't know, this whole inner web of guilt yep. and it's just so sad. It really is. Um, and to continue the sadness, <laughs> the, the <laughs> owl yeah, uh, are sad. all charge in on the Lethry army here in part three and get absolutely demolished. Humans are reduced to a handful of ash at moments. Brutal magic and destruction is is every single where uh, talk ends up firing an arrow that killed a Lethry mage and Bivat gets pissed, um, is super upset. And I mean, this this part is a part three, but man, it almost felt like a climax because it's also where and somebody was mentioning in chat hedge manifests manifest a cusser and blows Emroth away as we find out Emroth is looking to align with the cripple god and speaks of destroying warns mm -hmm. completely right um which is interesting and then we we realize that that could probably be a major implication on the rest of the series but hedge mentions to be uh manages uh to be able to do this thing uh or i'm sorry i apologize hedge mentions that to be able to do that they need dragon's blood and we have seen dead dragons all throughout this book yeah. and this is like one of those light bulbs right like oh well that's probably why we're seeing a ton of dead dragons mm. um 
and then <laughs> Dead Smell, which is a ridiculous name, uh, <laughs> insinuates that the shake, which we talked about earlier, may be remnants of the Tyst Andy. That's mentioned in this book. That I mean, is wow. mentioned in this book. Okay. It's a throw. It's one that. line. Yeah. Um, and then closing out oh. part three, and I'm kind of just rifling through these as we go, because a lot of these get a conclusion uh, in part four. But Aaron sets a trap for male and male falls for it when trying to save Tahol and Janath. If anything happens to bug, I swear to God, I'll write and write Erickson a mean email is what I have here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, what is the sea demon of the Tysted or Feather Witch talks about? I don't know. Uh, and we also talked about how in the clothes Roulette's parents pass away. Um, a lot to unpack there, but I think a lot mm -hmm. of it gets resolved here in part four. So I think we should just dive in here because part four has a lot of things that we probably want to talk about. And I don't want to yeah. keep you guys too, too late. Um, yeah, we definitely have to talk about the Malazans um, and the whole approach yeah. to uh, the whole approach to Letheros and everything else uh, and how the Marines really take it on the chin there uh, as they're advancing and and improvising the whole way. And of course, you know, you get a lot of fiddlers uh, perspective there, yeah. which is awesome. Um but then there's the famous, you know, Hellion Tavern run. Yeah. Where it saves the day. So good. Um, but then I think that the, it, it's really interesting what happens at Letheros and the, 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 the battle that takes place there, where you have the betrayal of the Tice Edor by the Letheri. And that tremendous moment that all of us know, you know, is, 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 is one of the most iconic moments in the entire series. Well, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's talk about that moment uh, where it's not just beak too. It, it is beak, but it's also what happens between the Malazans and the Tice Edor there where Fiddler, this huge cataclysmic, you know, monstrous cloud of magic is about to just descend on everyone and Beak has produced this incredible, you know, uh, and, and sacrificing himself uh, in this incredible dome to save everyone. And, and Fiddler is asking, is telling the, the Tice Eater, come on, get in here. You know, we're no longer trying to kill each other. We're all surviving here together. Let's do it. You know, so that, that, that is just a, tr so tr What a scene. I mean, how do you even talk about that? It's just so tremendous. Yeah, I think it's one of the best I've I've like in the series and that I've seen, I thought is, uh, I mean, not just his death, but his story, man, like the brother's suicide messed me up pretty bad. Um, yeah. and yeah. then one of the most powerful moments that I've read in Malazan is, uh, hood showing him compassion, uh, and the brothers yeah. reunite with him as he gets to the gate literally brought me to tears. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. When he's reunited with his brother, because oh. what was, what was Beak doing in his mind there? He was saving his family. Yeah, these people who have been his has he been his friends, his family, and for him, Man. this was a way to um, heal himself from the fact that he feels that he failed his brother. Mm. He feels that he failed his brother, and so this was a, mm. an incredible moment for for him, uh, a character who we get to know through Faraday's. Sword. Yeah, I was going to bring well, that up too. Becomes, Kind of a friend, kind of a mother figure to him. I mean, this is the woman who stepped on the scorpion. Beautiful union. Right? Everybody I swore her off. Her. I swore her off. I said, I'm done. Everybody hated her because she, she crushed joyful union. But look, she's the one yeah. who brought out Beak and who treated him as a human being. This and... is what I love about this, this series and about the military culture in this series yeah. is that you don't have just a leader and you know, the, the good soldiers, you have leaders within the soldiers and Farad and Sword, she really, she follows her own intuition. She doesn't go by what other people tell her. Yeah. She didn't do that with Joyful Union, obviously, but she didn't do that either at uh, Egaton. Um, and she doesn't do that with, with Beak either. Same with Hellion. Hellion. <laughs> yeah. Tavern to Tavern. Tactical strategy is obviously <laughs> her own leadership. And then what you said about Fiddler too, and, and yeah. him taking that risk. Uh, it also kind of takes me back a little bit to Egatan and and how, you know, the shift that we see with Korab. Yeah. And how quickly, Korab. and for some reason, Erickson has an ability to make that 
very convincing in such yeah. a short amount of time to see people shift their perspectives and their allegiance in such a short amount of time. It really worked. It worked then and it works in this book too. Yeah. 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 Um, th there's a lot of those moments of like character, you know, and, and another thing, some, I saw Erickson talking in a Q and a about beak and someone was like, maybe his, his arc should have been longer. And Erickson was like, it was always going to end this way. It was always yeah. going to, this is, this is how it had to be. It had to be a contained story in this book and it had to fit thematically. Um, I, I thought that was pretty powerful. Like writing a character that, you know, is going to end like this. I don't think is a very easy task. Yeah. Um, you also had the kind of uh, an echo of what happened with Itkovian back in Memories of yes. Ice when they built that mound of, of just little tributes that added up and it became a, a sacred site. And they do the same thing for Beak, which is also, I mean, come on, how many tears do I have here, you know? Um, and that's just, uh, you know, to see that tribute for this character who had been a bit of a loner. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, there were there were other mages who sort of tried to hug him, but he was so kind of socially awkward. And the fact that he would bring up his um, his trauma yeah. in, in such an innocent way that he would bring up the um, the fact that his his mother was uh, committing incest. Um, yeah. Um, yes. And yeah. All of this stuff, and and uh, so he was not exactly ostracized, but people were uncomfortable around him. And, and he kind of knew that and he didn't quite understand how to engage. And so you, he was already a character that you, you already, your heart sort of bleeds for, you know, you're like one of those mages that you want to give him a hug. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so for this character to end up in that place where he is accessing all these Warrens and, um, and saving his family, you know, it's just and trying to hold it together the entire time for everybody around him. Yeah. And, and uh, Saradin, if I'm saying that right, like it, it is really the support system for it. It's it's yeah. honestly incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, another really uh, moment that resonated with me a lot. <clears throat> it's because I really love this character is whenever uh, Saren and Featherwitch are both attempting to invade Udinas's mind. And he says, I am a slave no more. Oh, like, let's fucking go. Like I, I was like, that's that's it right there. Udinese that whole me. scene got to me Woo! so much. Mm -hmm. I felt like the scene, the part when Saren kind of comes out of that and he has his hand on her throat. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had a hand on my throat <laughs> when yeah. I read that part. I was I was shook. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really feel this stuff. Uh, you you really really do. Um, yeah. And it's interesting, too, because there's also a part, too, when Udinas talks about the myth of ever being an ex-slave, too, about how that always yeah. kind of stays with you, too. Yeah, it's a beautiful passage. I wish I would have wrote it down because I re now you say that I remember reading that and I think I read it two or three times. And I was like, man, I bet that resonates <laughs> with a lot of people. Yeah. Odinas is the is the expert at exposing BS. You know, I mean, his that scene where he. He yeah. tells the story where he flips everything and he makes the hero who fear thinks of himself as the hero. And he's sort of very cynically telling, retelling this story and, and showing how we all kind of walk around with these narratives in our head. And we think of ourselves as the good guys and we think of the other people as the bad guys. And, you know, we have these, um, kind of self-fulfilling narratives that uh, we walk around with and, and often we're very wrong, you know? And so Udinas, yeah. he's the one who, who just sees through all this stuff. Right. Yeah. But he really, he really I, love a, I love a cynical old man. Yeah. <laughs> I do too. It's my jam. I yeah. see myself going that way. <laughs> uh, uh, we obviously get red mass failing. Um, it all comes up short. The change of mile turn on him, which is just, wild uh and we've kind of already talked about it but the fact that red mask uh kind of signifies and everyone being covered with mud does signify the fact that um after so many atrocities by both sides the other does not exist everyone is now changed yeah. uh for the worse and i think i actually the more i've read about erickson talking about red mask the more i love that storyline i already enjoyed it to begin with yeah um so another moment here that bothered me just a bit. It's going to be just a little bit. Talk dies. 
Um, oh. And I say, it, it, obviously, I told you guys I love him. He can be a kind of a dunce a little bit, but I, I love him. Um, I hope there's more to this. And he started out as a fave and slowly became more and more uh, perilous to me. And I couldn't understand what he was doing, but him sacrificing himself for the children to get away was pretty amazing. I will say yeah. that. I really love that. And I loved, loved Tool showing up at the bar gas and crying for talk because mm. Tool is such a good character. Um, and, you know, talk's face gets cut off here, which is pretty intense. But then there's this moment where Hood tells Talk he meets Hood, and Hood says that your soul was promised to me by your dad, Talk the Elder. And I don't know what that means, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I'm <laughs> like, what does that really mean? Um, That's kind of a read and find out thing. Yeah. I have some context now that I've read on. Oh yeah, um, okay. but in this regard, just kind of my thoughts in the moment. So if you if you're listening to this and you were confused by that, I was too. Don't worry, you're supposed to be. Um, but man, yeah, Talk dying here. Um, it was interesting. It was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hurt. Yeah, that's a heartbreaking scene. Yeah, I love talk. Like, I really, really do. And he dies in just such a brutal way. I was sad. Yeah. I was very sad. Um, we move into Quick Ben massacring the dragons. Uh, one runs off, one turns uh, on Menador, and then died to Quick Ben and Hedge. Hedge seems as if he's alive again at the end of this, or at least in this realm. Um I thought that that was pretty awesome. I enjoyed that. Um, quick Ben, big level up, big level up here in this book. Um, and we get a reunion. We get a yeah. reunion of Troll and Saren, but at the cost of a huge showdown where Clip kills Fear. Troll wants to kill Clip, but Ruin stands in his way and Ruin smashes Troll barely uh, and also defeats Onrak at the same time. He ends up stabbing Kettle to murder her. And out of Kettle, a creation of an Azeth herself, a new Azeth is born. And this gives the dying realm life and means the Amass can live on. I got chills yeah. saying that last line. Yeah. And this, this happens uh, at the gate, right? Or at a gate, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's at the gate. Because I, I, I remember thinking at that point, right. like, it seems like nothing good ever happens at gate. gates. Gates. <laughs> That's actually true. Is there something to that? <laughs> That's actually funny. <laughs> Think uh, about it. It seems like nothing good ever happens at Gates. So every time well, I, I mean, Gates, some good happened. Troll yeah, and Saren probably, are back together. I'm probably wrong about that, but but yeah, they're off, often they're often tears between realms and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. maybe it signifies walking through a door to a whole new you know area, and you're jumping ahead. I don't know. I'm sure there <laughs> Eric's thing could explain to me in amazing. Were you detail. shocked by any of that, Jimmy? Was I shocked? Yes. Of course I was shocked. I was distraught <laughs> because I ended up liking fear a bit. And, and uh, oh, yeah. uh, but the, the, this, the futility you know. of, of fear's whole mission there. I mean, he, 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 he had a noble purpose. He wanted to redeem his people. He wanted to save them from the crippled God by finding Scavendari blood eyes soul and returning their God to them and, and, and getting away from the crippled God. So he had a noble purpose. Um, but I think that there, there was a bit of an, I like fear, but there was a bit of an arrogance to him as well. And uh, particularly in, in, you can see it in his interactions with Udinas, you know? And but doesn't Udinas then beautifully, like so mercifully yeah. uh, defend fear's death to, or lies to troll about fear's death. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, he understands, I think he, there's a, it's a weird thing because the, there is a hatred there uh, but there's also respect and even a, and a, on some level, even love, you know, yes. between them. and fear does the same thing with Udinas. You know, there are moments when fear seems to understand what he's done to this man. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, does he ever come out and entirely admit it? Probably no, but there are some gestures that suggest that he, he gets it. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Someone had a question. Why was Wither trying to kill Udinas? I, I don't remember. Do, do you, either of you remember? Wither is that. is don't forget that Wither is Tice to Andy, so in that moment he's going to side with Silcus Ruin. Uh, I think it might have something to do with that. If that's what you're talking about, Mitch, um, okay. but uh, because Udinas was in a very futile way on the other trying to oppose Silcus Ruin in a sense. Uh, you know what? I was confused by that too. I do remember that now. Yeah, like, Wither was a little bit. Situation? Wither was a little shaky for me as well because yeah. some stuff yeah. was going on. Um, 
man, Kettle dying and like the Azith being born out of her and then it all comes together is like, I mean, it's it's pretty wild. The new Azith um, will have all the gates to all the realms and Quick Ben immediately is like, did Shadow Throne and Cotillion know this the entire time? <laughs> and you're like, son, like, if that's true, Shadow Throne has to be one of the most diabolical geniuses uh, that we've ever seen. I can't wait to get those answers later because um, I don't know. Um, but I'm trying to see here. Yeah, so uh, Ulshan Prowl is on rack and Kalava's son who had been given the thinnest, a.k.a. the dagger from Gothos. Yep. This was the dagger used to kill Kettle in Hell Skabadari's soul. Exactly. I mean, come on, folks. Come on. <laughs> Where, what where what other series would never you ever find something like this you know listen i think brandon sanders has some really interesting plots and he pulls a lot of things that i don't see coming and it's really neat i i, I think this is one of the most well crafted and this is why i said like i said reaper girl is my least favorite of the first seven but listen it's amazing like that is so expertly crafted uh, and little pieces that are in front of you the entire time end up adding up to this big conglomerate of, of a climax. It's just so impressive. That's it's what blows my mind is every time I get to the end of a book, a Malazan book, and then I go back uh, at tabs that I have towards the beginning and I'm like, what? This, this seed was here and here. I just had no context for it. And suddenly at the end, oh, I have context boom. for this now. And, and, and on top of that, oh, not even just that, Joanna, but think, think of all the things that, you know, we're sitting here learning from Philip or, or Philip's learning from like the themes are also layered. I mean, it's yeah. just, yeah. 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 Lee is so right. I mean, of course it's obvious how Rulad is, is an embodiment of futility and fear as well, but I mean, poor troll. We have to talk about troll here, don't we? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh yeah. That yeah. just broke me. That yeah. Broke we're, we're, me. We're getting there. Also, someone said I need to read Asimov books. I will. Yay. Um, All right. Thank you. Also. I've already <laughs> I've already read the Knight of Knives. Hi, Mom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we will get to the troll moment. Uh, but I want to talk about Bruce and Trana uses one of Bryce's fingers to resurrect him. Oh, shit. Uh, mm -hmm. Tehal has crashed the economy, and I love him for it. <laughs> I love the flood verbiage that's being used, a mentioning of a sea demon just so on brand for the ending and what is to come. Yeah. Um, and then we're, I'm glad Janeth murdered Tanal, but the <laughs> abuse that he put her through was hard to get through and very nauseating, which yeah. I'll, I'll just say this real quick. Uh, Erickson was actually questioned, kind of challenged at this. Um, one of the people who hosted the read along was very disturbed by this and felt like it crossed a line. And, um, he said that at the time in the news, torture and such was actually in mainstream media and in the news. And it was being told from the torturers or the um, the abusers point of view. And he said, I wanted to tell it from the victims. And he said, if it bothered you, good. Thank God that it bothered you because it should bother you. Uh, and essentially this says, you know, he doesn't he doesn't want to pull any punches. He wants to write about things that are real. And, uh, you know, I obviously know that, you know, there's certain people who don't want to read that and that's totally acceptable, especially yeah. with past traumas and stuff. I totally understand that, yeah. but I do think that it's a pretty bold move to include this level of, um, detail. And he actually brought up a good point. He said, you know, I didn't go into the grotesque details as some of the more popular, um, things that romanticized torture happen to do. Um, but he did make you feel, uh, the torture emotionally. And I don't know, it's just a really bold thing to do and it's hard to do correctly. Um, right. I don't know if I'm the person to rate whether it was done well or not, to be honest. Um, well, but I think you have to, I think you've made some good points there, Jimmy. And I think what one thing I would point out is it's not voyeuristic. It is clearly not being done for pleasure. It's not yeah. stimulating. It is not, it's not at all being presented in that way. And furthermore, what Erickson typically does is he deals with the repercussions. You know, mm -hmm. what he does is when tough things happen, horrible things happen in the world. And I think it's the job of literature to deal with these things. And uh, it does matter how you, how you do it. It matters yeah. how you portray them, how, if, whether or not you deal with the repercussions, but Erickson is one who will almost always show you the aftermath, show you what happens to the character as a result, show you the trauma, what it does to a person. Also, it, you, you get the repercussions on the perpetrator as well and what they become as a result of their actions. So I, I would argue that it, what he does is actually very important 
and it's difficult and 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 people should know that this series has these these very difficult things but but there, I think that there's a place and, and, and even I would say it's a necessity to deal with these things in literature. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think it's hard because, I mean, there is sexual violence. There's rape in every single one of these books, except for two, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Gardens of the Moon and Bone Hunter. So I think those are the only two books in this 10 book series where I didn't read a rape scene. And male and, and female. Male and female. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right, Philip, that he does deal with the repercussions of it. And um, I think one thing, it's hard. I, I do not fault people for avoiding this series or a certain content in this series if they come from a past of emotion, of sexual trauma. Uh, I think that's something everyone should be aware of, that we're all coming from different places Absolutely. with that, with our comfort levels on that. And one thing that I also, but one thing that I do appreciate is that there is never a situation that I have seen as regarding rape in which it was like, the woman asked for it kind of thing oh, no. yeah. or, you know yeah. what I mean? Because yeah. I think that's a huge misconception. It's still a misconception in our yeah. culture. I think that women are dressed, dressing a certain way or yes. whatever. This Janet is a scholar. Uh, she's not. <laughs> she's a whole mentor. Yeah. And it, she's it's, brilliant. So, and, and some, you know, I, I'm not an expert on, you know, the, the minds of a, the mind of a rapist, but I have, um, from what I've understood or learned from various sources is that people don't rape because they are um, sexually turned on. It's not like that. It's power. It's a power thing. Yeah. And you well, see that very yeah, much being the case yeah. in this situation with Janet and with, I'm sorry, is blanking on his name right now, but yeah. it's a power trip for him. Yeah. Tanal is, is, is almost threatened by Janet. Yes. Tanal Yathmar. Well, she keeps calling him little man. Because mm -hmm. she understands yeah. exactly what you just said, Joanna. He feels powerless. He's he is a, a part of this a, um, exploitative society yeah. where you have a few you have a few winners, the one percent, the people in charge, and you have a bunch of people who are made to feel like losers all the time. And this is his way of he he feels like a, a nobody, and he's treated like that by Carlos and Victor constantly, reminding him how how little he is and how, and Jonathan understands that what he's doing is he's trying to feel empowered, right? By yeah. doing this to her. And she calls him what he is, little man, you know? Um, yeah. And uh, so it, it's, it's, it's horrible and it's sad. Um, but I do think that Erickson deals with it in a way that is very responsible and um, the way that I would want to see it dealt with in literature um, so yeah. And it's not always true in fantasy. I, I'm afraid that there's a lot of fantasy where it is more voyeuristic Yes, uh, and, and they don't deal with the repercussions in a way that I feel is, is, um, uh, that should be done. So, yeah, I would agree with that. Even some of my favorite authors, um, are definitely guilty of that. Um, yeah, I think George Martin, for example, you know, uh, I love his books. I think he's brilliant, but I think that there are moments in a song of ice and fire that are uh, more voyeuristic than, than what Erickson does. I mean, Germ's my favorite author of all time. And yeah. I would, I would agree with that. I yeah. think that, that, that is a weakness. Um, also, I thought it was interesting. Someone said uh, their favorite authors are Erickson and Germ, and they'd love to hear a conversation. Apparently there used to be a really big rivalry between Malazan fans and song of ice and fire in the early 2010s. And oh. Erickson commented on this in an interview with a magazine. I, I can't remember what magazine it was. Um, it was a bit, it was a big magazine, but uh, he was talking and he said like him and Gurm have talked and he has no idea why their fans are at odds because yeah. like, they're very much like, like they respect each other. Like they obviously th like a acknowledge yeah. each other's mastery in the craft. And he's yeah. like, I think it's because people get obsessed with one thing and they're such big worlds that they have to like stand by theirs and they don't want to keep like, he's basically saying, well, you guys should both be reading both. Like they're both great. Um, yeah. So they I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really want to highlight this question. I think it's an excellent question. Mitch said, a bit of a weird question, but do you Ooh. think it was right of mail to take away Janice? Memories? I was wondering that too. Mitch, great question. after what we learn, yeah. the yeah. way things are, this is discussed in yeah. uh, Midnight Tides. Yes. It's a great question. Yeah. I, I think that we're not necessarily meant to, to think that it was the right thing to do. I don't think Erickson is saying, I mean... Male is acting out of compassion, but sometimes we make mistakes when we're acting out of compassion too. 
So did he do the right thing? I think it's a very uh, awesome question and very important question. And yeah. I don't necessarily have the right answer, but um, it's tough because you can understand why he was doing it. He was trying to help her, but at the same time, you, is, is it right to take away someone's experience like that? Um, and of course, a, a lot of times with traumatic events like that, our brains do it we, uh, automatically. Um, people will um, repress those experiences, but, but yeah, it's a great question. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe as Rupert says, maybe it's, it's a bit paternalistic to assume that he would uh, do that to her without her permission. You know, maybe it would have been if he had asked her, perhaps it's a, it's a tough one. What's AP saying about it? Mail takes away the memories in contrast to how Serampatic's storyline ran. So it is a contrast for uh, of the two approaches to suggest yeah. that these very questions to the reader. Yeah. What are you doing awake, AP? Yeah, <laughs> if you're going to be awake, you, you just jump in. Just come on in, bro. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What time is it there? Huh. Well, anyway, yeah. we're, we're happy to see you. He's a savage man. Yeah, I think that one, Mitch, great, great for you to pick that's, up that. That's a great question, though. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll be that's honest, really I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's good because we're getting I to the really that good you're stuff here. With the insomnia, AP, because that's just the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, murdering of Tahal Tanal was great. Uh, Errant drowns Feather Witch. Um. I thought she was driving his actions and his deity status. What a turn of events where Aaron kind of takes back and is like, like as a reader, you're starting to posture, like, man, these gods really are not in control. Like their followers, she's kind of like, she's kind of blackmailing him into doing this. And then the Aaron's like, just kidding. Watch this. Mm. Yeah. Murders are crazy. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. It's, it's a bit sad too, because like you said, oh, yeah. Much as I dislike Feather Witch, I had built up a little bit of sympathy for well, her. Well, we get her backstory. It's tragic. Yeah. Very, yeah. very tragic. Yeah. Um, and also, at the same vein, Hannon Mosag gets murdered by a Jagho. Is this Gothis? Does Gothis murder Hannon Mosag? Is that what this is? Can I someone don't remember tell me? that very well. I just know a Jaghut does it, and I was like, wait, who is this? I wasn't sure. Well, there was a female Jagat who showed up too, right? Um... Maybe, and maybe this is... The, I just have a bunch of question marks around it. So if anyone knows in the chat, please <laughs> let me know. Um, I'm trying to think now. I'm, I'm yeah. Nice help us we'll move on as we do this, but uh, Icarium is, um, I don't think it was Gothos. I, I'm going to, now and that I'm it. reading it, I don't think it's Gothos either. I think I just thought of the first Jag that came to mind. When I wrote it down. He's a famous one for sure. Yeah. He's not bad. Um, Icarium, which by the way, Carson notices that he's like half Toblakai. Uh, by looking at his face when he finally sees Akarium, which is huge. Yeah. Um, but Akarium's at the scale house with an invention he had created. He has a huge explosion of energy and it wrecks the city, killing Veed and Taxilian. It leads to a crack in a canal and up rises male, baby. Seems those who are lost to Icarium's, uh, Akarium, sorry, explosion have lost all memories as Akarium once did as well. I found this to be interesting because we're seeing Akarium take action now and drive his own decisions where we saw him kind of led around before by Mapo. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy scene and mail coming up from the ground. I was, I knew it was coming. I was like, let's go. I love mail. Yeah, yeah. that was cool. I well, also just to back part... up on what you said too. I, I loved the interaction between Icarium and, uh, and Carsa. I was just absolutely fascinating and nerve wracking. <laughs> I was a bit <laughs> yeah. nervous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, the, uh -huh. the buildup to Akarium's explosion was very good as well, because I mean, the whole time I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting for the big level up. Um, yeah. It, so it, does anybody else mourn for Terralac Veed? You know? Yeah, I did. Uh, because I love myself. I love spitting phlegm into my hands. And <laughs> yeah. my hair well, yeah. the black tree. AP, you were, you were saying you had uh, bedhead. All you got to do is, is imitate just, Terralac Veed. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, just grease it, <laughs> pull the the brows back. I mean, it's yeah, easy. it's a quick fix, and then you could jump on the chat. You could be on the <laughs> chat. I'll just do a Terralac Veed and, and join us, please. <laughs> I mean, Veed is disgusting, but you got to think about this. Akarium, in a lot of ways, I mean, it's obviously super dangerous, but like him being able to take, um, you know, back, back that power in those decisions is partially because of Veed's treachery in a lot of ways. 
So it, it, it is it is um, something that we're thinking about if Veed yeah. uh, was necessarily a bad guy. I don't know. I don't know that I feel I mean, it seemed like he was a really, ex, you know, bad guy for a while there, very exploitive. But then I think there were parts in this book. I think it was this book that there were parts that made me wonder if there was a change about to happen right before he. he yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, guy, oh. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're also getting confirmation that the Jag Hut Huntress yeah. was the one male dead with the male night tides who built the prison for the, um, the demon. Yeah, Frank also put that in there. So okay. thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. We, we don't remember it all. <laughs> we don't remember it all. Yeah. Um, but I did, I, I do build up some sympathy for, for even good old Terralac V, who yeah. seems to regret his role in all of this. And he seems to have lost a lot of his arrogance as a result of seeing... Uh, seems to care about Akarium, too. He actually starts to care about him. So, yeah, I mean, I did feel bad when he got squished under that bit yeah. of uh, masonry or whatever it was. It yeah. seems like he underestimated Icarium. I got the impression of that. And then later on, started to care for him. That was yeah. sort of my yeah. impression. And also, think I think he realized the weight of the situation. Um, for sure. Uh, it was manipulated by the Nameless Ones, too. That's right. That is right. Um, Terralac Bead has a fascinating arc, and Philip is bringing up points I would have. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> he had been lied to about what Akarium was. That's right. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I bet the phlegm. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Yeah. Um, so Bryce arrives to slay a Victad and save Tahole. I put in capital letters, I'm screaming. Because <laughs> yes. I was like, so, yes. I was so pumped. Oh, the return of Breeze Bedict. Yeah. I mean, there this is too stacked. Much in that ending. There's so too stacked. Too much. We're not it's even to the best part. And bad things. Like it was that, um, it's sort of, yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I, I don't know if you catastrophe works here, but I mean, it just felt very sad and tragic and hopeful and happy and <laughs> all epic. at once. Epic yeah. of epicness. It's so good. Um, and we get the Carson roulette battle. Uh, I thought oh. this was just dope. I, I love that Carson uh, Carson saws off roulette sword arm just before the sword enters his leg. Semar Dev releases Kuro Khan, which we talked about earlier in the knife, uh, yeah. who was trapped in her blade. Uh, this saves Carson and teleports him to the crippled God's beach. And we know that Carson then frees Rulad's soul by decapitation in the Cripple God's realm or wherever they are. And Cripple God says, this was the plan all along. I always mm -hmm. wanted you here. Take the sword. <laughs> it belongs to you, Carson. All part of the plan. And Carson's like, no. <laughs> yeah. And just turns his back. And Withal shows up to destroy the Cripple God's sword. And I said that this was a bit of an odd ending for this. Not bad. Odd for the fact that I'm like, what does the Cripple God do now? Like, that is a huge, well, usually about this point in the series, you see the, the enemy per se, which I'm not even sure. I'm sure I'll feel sympathetic towards him eventually, but uh, <laughs> it's like, usually you see the big baddie kind of level up like right before the ending and kind of set the stage, you know, that's not what happened here at all. Right. Yeah. Um, it it the, did. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't at all. The decapitation was crazy, by the way. So good. Yeah, and um, anyone who ever accuses Karsa of being a dumb barbarian needs mm. to uh, reevaluate oh. real fast. How uh, dare they? I challenge them to an arm wrestling competition. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, quick Hedge and Fiddler fight off Ruin in dragon form. Such um, such yeah. a boys back together moment and it absolutely ruled. And I feel like it was uh, the feel good moment we needed with all the treachery that happened in this book. We really needed this. Um I, I love Fiddler. I really do. Yeah. And also we know how powerful Rune is. Like we said, uh, Cripple God was fearing him. Uh, we see him beat up Troll. I mean, for in Onrak as well. So to see uh, Quick Hedge and Fiddler come together is just some grunts and, and a sorcerer too. Uh, it was fantastic. Some cussers. It was great. Yeah. Um, the highest moment in this book for me, happy wise, is to hold becoming Emperor. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. It's tremendous. It just all seemed for me, it just felt like just one thing happened after another that was sad and happy. And it just, man, like I said, I cried harder at the end of this and at the end of this book than any other book that I read last year. Yeah. Well, there's one moment left to talk about here in part four and uh, I'll recap it here and we can talk about it. Um, so it. that piece of shit patriotist Siren <laughs> oh, wow. stabbed troll in oh. the heart. 
Yes. And he was nudged to do it by the errant, it would seem. Errant seems upset yep. that he did it, but he says uh, it is he is what he is. And I have to question whether or not, again, I've questioned this before, Does do the gods have free will or do their actions not come from their own bidding at all and just the power that holds them and the role that they must play in this game? It, it, I think it's worth asking that because Aaron seemed very reluctant to do this. Or is it just duty? Um, but man, this killed me. And I'm curious to see what you two think of this because I know, for instance, Alan absolutely hates this ending. He hates this moment. And uh, I don't think that that's necessarily um, unjust because a lot of people don't love, you know, uh, don't love it not being this big epic moment, right? It's it's it's, it's almost like a nobody in some ways uh, taking out one of our most beloved characters. But that's oh, what happens yes, sometimes. that's Yeah, yeah. Does and the errant lets that happen, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the role of the errant there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I mean... I know that Philip is probably going to say that I should have compassion for the errand, but <laughs> I hate the <laughs> errand. <laughs> no. No. I've never heard you say that about anyone before. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, I hated him in that moment. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm, I'm fine with that because oh, okay. I think the, the errand is a lot like... Um, what are the, the Lord and the Lady um, that are pushing and pulling all the time? Um, they're the newer version of the Errant. Why am I forgetting their name? Um, they're the two sides of... Uh... Uh, Opon? Thank you, Opon. Oh, yeah. okay. The hey, I, I knew something. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, so yeah, the, the Errant is very similar to the to Opon in the sense that... Um, oh, what is AP saying? He's probably going to... Say everything I'm about. Yeah, I, I can actually read it if you want. He says, "Aaron, nature versus nurture. Why does the scorpion kill the frog? Yeah. Aaron is who he is and has it, been from. That's kind of where I'm going. Yeah. So what? It, what is life? You know, you, you look at life, and life is full of tragedy, and it's true, full of joys. It's it's full of wonder, and it's full of of sorrow. Uh, and the fact is, you cannot have life without death. You know, you cannot have joy without sorrow you these are these are all sides of a coin and what these these fickle gods represent they're 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 in a way they're a physical uh, personification of of this abstraction this idea that life is all the good and the bad all together and you can't have one without the other so yeah, yeah it's great when you have if you had a book that you know what I mean? When you have a book that ends just a little too happy, there's no, there's no, that's why most great fantasy books, even though we like to see the hero's triumph and, and good prevail over evil, there's always some loss. There's Scouring always the, some, the elves all leave Middle Earth or magic is lost to the world or the Shire's burnt. Yeah. Something has to, I mean, because it just wouldn't be compelling otherwise. So for me, the, the errant is, an embodiment of that principle in a sense. And yes, it sucks that troll died, but it seems so true to life in a way too, doesn't it? Um, that, that, yeah, yeah I mean, there good things happen. Uh, people we like though, get sick and die. And, and that's just, it's, it's horrible, but that's, it's part of the deal, isn't it? It's part of the deal. Um, yeah. And it's, 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 it's also what lends life. It's preciousness though, isn't it? The fact that, it is full of tragedy and it is full of sorrow. So, so yeah, I, sometimes I hate the Aaron too, uh, <laughs> but um, I think I get, I think I get it. I, I, I think that um, you don't want the book to end just all happy, happy stuff. Um, so no, certainly not. And there um, is the, the fact that it, it, we lose troll, but uh, he had his moment with Saren um, and um you know, that, that you have to hold on to those beautiful moments because that's what all we get, you know? I think that also broke my heart even more is just uh, feeling so much emotion about those two getting together and then that happening to troll. And I think what you said too, it just, I think that was something, the way I know what bothered Alan, I think I'm probably gonna, well, I probably shouldn't speak for Alan, but I'm gonna try is the <laughs> idea that, <laughs> is the idea that troll was able to fight off so much in previous parts of the book um he showed himself to be a really fantastic warrior and then just to die by somebody just a nobody 
stabbing him in the back. Yeah, but that's yeah. But, that's but I know that you're is, saying too. that that is part of the tragedy, part of the just unfairness and bitter part of life, right? Is that and that's kind of what the errant rep represents in a way. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah, one hundred percent. And yeah, I, I, I see here in the chat, uh, Benjamin talking about that troll dying that way at the hands of a nobody. Yep. Right? Yeah. But yeah. It's, so true to, it's so true to life. People die in the most random ways and especially in, in, in situations of violence and combat. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to quote Erickson here. Uh, someone basically asked him in the Q and a and said, man, you know, uh, th this ended up to disappoint me. I find the series epic, but, uh, you know, didn't, um, Felison didn't, and Udenas didn't all these characters like troll deserve better. And Erickson's answer is so many people deserve better. Don't you yep. think? Yep. That's the thing is like in fantasy, you want this glorious end. You want to leave the end in the blaze of glory, kind of like our, our character Korab, he's always kind of uh, <laughs> dreaming of glory, right? Glory and war. And yeah. it doesn't always work out that way. And I, I think Erickson really highlights that throughout the series, not only with the main characters, but I think even in this book, there are scenes, little tiny scenes of characters that we don't know, that we think we're about to know. And suddenly they get ripped off by a chain, chain chamal <laughs> and their brains or entrails are hanging out and yeah. it just ends. And you like, what? <laughs> and I think um, no matter what the last moment of your life is, no matter who it is that held the sword, you always have to think what a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Like AP yeah. was saying it was, it, it, you had this going on in guards of the moon with Lauren. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, Absolutely. it was like, wow, what a shame, you know? Yeah. yeah. I personally love it. I love it because uh, life's unfair and that is kind of how it goes. And uh, for it's me, I, I I like that stuff. I always have. Um, I think people have uh, had this kind of same feeling towards Kerm in some ways, but also Robin Hobb. And I've always kind of defended it uh, for being like, it's tough to swallow, but it is what it is kind of thing. Now, obviously your own subject, like you don't have to, I'm not saying you have to like it. I happen to though. Uh, and yeah. uh, whew, it's rough. Like troll was probably, in my opinion, like to I think of Tavor, I think of troll, like of, of really main because I like like tool and stuff, but there's always like other stuff going along um, with those characters. But troll, I didn't care for him so much when I first met him, even in the pro. I was like, what is this? And yeah. then you know, with House of Chains, like I mean, troll was fine. I enjoyed the time with Onrak, but uh didn't grow me in midnight tides i was like man he's one of like one of the best characters in this book like one of the best characters in fantasy and uh yeah man your heroes die hard man it re in a lot of ways it reminds me of like mma so uh, in, in mma what happens is uh dudes never retire when they should and uh age catches up to them all and yeah. watching your favorite fighters and people maybe you look up to uh, just getting decimated and in a lot of ways of uh, people feel like they're ruining their legacy, which that's another argument that I don't agree with, but whatever. Uh, but seeing that uh, kind of feels the same way <laughs> that seeing troll get uh, stabbed by a relatively low uh, ranked character, I guess you would say. Uh, Not only low rank, but just a, a, a despicable person. Yeah. He's an asshole. He's For a sure. coward. He's a coward. Yeah, he's a coward. hundred percent. Wanted to prove his manhood basically by, by offing somebody by stabbing him in the back. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if, uh, if there's a legend around Saren at this point. Um, cause I think as a society, uh, there's a lot of cowards that take innocent people's life or, you know, people that we, we would revere and, uh, they end up kind of being immortalized for the action, even if it is despicable. And I'm curious to see what Erickson does with Saren later. If he's even brought up again, uh, it'll be fascinating to see any commentary that he might have on that. Yeah. So, oh, Ruth and Bad is here too. My goodness, this is a convergence now, isn't it? Wow, Ruth and Bad. I, yeah. I am, I am humbled, sir. He was a real man. Damn right he was. <laughs> Damn right he was. Uh, so we kind of leave off. Uh, we see that Clip is going to manipulate Amanda and his group. We didn't really talk about it much. Uh, we can talk about that until the hounds. Um, I'll be honest. The Namander stuff. I understand why it's there now, but in this book, I was ne not necessarily into it um but we see that that's kind of setting up toll the hounds 
um, and Clip is deceptive. But the big thing is, is that Sarah and Paddock is pregnant and a widow. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, why you do this? Yeah. <laughs> why you hurt me so bad, man? Yeah. Oh, man. We did it. We did Reaper skill, folks. Yay. We did it. <sighs> yeah. 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 <sighs> Those Q and A's I feel like brought a lot to this discussion. Uh, and I, I want to thank Erickson for being so transparent every time he gets an opportunity to talk about his workers process. Yeah. Um, it adds so much to the conversation. Yeah. And I think some people look at that and they go, well, that gives you a bias because you know, the, and well, it's there for everyone to read folks. And I wish more authors were more upfront with the way um, they went about not just their process, but also the decisions they make and what they were trying to do. And um, Erickson's so well-spoken in these Q and A's that I read. And it's honestly almost as joyous as reading the book itself in a lot of ways. So I really encourage you all to go check out the tour reread that was many years ago at this point, I think, but uh, at the end of each book, I shouldn't say each, some of the books, he has a Q and a section. It's really worth reading some of the oh, questions. I, you know, I've never read any of those Q and A's. I'll oh, have to check them out. It's been a huge resource for me whenever I miss something. Um, it's, it, it's very good. Um, so if you're, if you're reading the books for the first time or even a reread and you haven't checked it out, please do. It's over at tour. Um, this is not sponsored. I just really like it. <laughs> yeah. I have read a couple of those like uh summary, like just reactions to chapters. Yeah. I've read it maybe like one or two. And they've been very, very good. It's been very interesting. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. yes. And you have to light a candle after you finish yeah, this book. I will, I will light a candle. flicker yeah. in the dark tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what other people really worried about the prospect? Carson Ikarian. I wanted to see it. Are you kidding? I didn't want either of them to die because <laughs> I love them. But, oh, my God, I wanted to. Talk about MMA. Yeah. Wait, don't lie, Jimmy. I have the emails to prove you just emailed me. The <laughs> That's fair. Oh dear. That's fair. I mean, you're also a great resource and uh Philip and Joanna, you are too. Oh, um thank you. you know, Joanna, it makes me a little sad you said you felt like you were alone during these last books. So um, you know, because for me this has been such a social experience reading through Malazan and it's been so rewarding to be on this chat though and to be a part of this. It's just it's so wonderful to discuss these books with people. It really is, and it's just amazing because man, I just want to keep talking about him. <laughs> well, we will. I don't I mean, feel it's... tired at all. I, you know, it's, I read those last three books back to back basically. And I did not feel as though I burned out at all. Yeah. I am going to be trying to finish a uh, Malaz in this month. I'm, I'm going to read dust of the dreams in probably about two weeks and I'm going right into the cripple God. So it'll probably be the first week of February, but I will be, uh, I'll be wrapping it up and, and we got to talk to the hounds. So yeah. I'm hoping I can get you guys back on relatively soon to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, especially while it's fresh in my mind right now. Lee, uh, I just want to tell you, Lee, that I am in honor of Tihol. I am wearing a tweed blanket, but I'm not going <laughs> to tell you. Terrific. You're wearing a what? A tweed blanket? Yeah. Oh, my God. You're not going to show us, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can always bring your gear up. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that that's uh, that's extra. That's on the OnlyFans, uh, Doctor Fantasy OnlyFans. Uh, it's... Yeah, yeah, that's only for the uh, the, the patrons. Sorry. The patrons. That's right. That's right. Nice. Uh, nice. Uh, yeah, everyone. By that's... the way, uh, I just want to shout out chatting with nuts because it was through the live show you had with Steven Erickson. Where in the chat, a lot of the wonderful people here in your community were telling me read Dust of Dreams and the Cribble God back to back. And so I did take that advice to heart. Thanks to all of you in the chat who were there. And I am so glad I did it that way. I, I definitely think that's the way to go. That's the way I'm doing it as well. Yeah. I, I hear that from everybody. Um, yeah. I, I, I think I'm going to be having Erickson on again at some point. His city would like to reprise the conversation. Um, I don't want to, over, you know, I don't want to overburden him or anything or, or um, ask too much of him or anything like that. But um, that chat was pretty excellent and uh, awesome. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and chatting with nuts, by the way, we'll be back uh, January 21st. I had some scheduling issues here in the first few weeks because of uh, things out of my control. So January 21st, typical, you know, Friday, 7 30 PM Eastern time. Um, my guest will be announced, but it's a, a special guest returning Ooh. guest um, that, so that will be fun. Um, if you guys are looking out for that, uh, Joanna, Philip, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys so much. Well, thank, thank you, Jimmy. You. It, it's always a, a joy and it's uh, I, I really appreciate you inviting me and, and Joanna for this discussion and everybody in the chat. Thank you as well, because 
you guys add so much and sometimes we even lean on you guys. So we, we appreciate you. Um, but Jimmy, yep. You're, you're again, congratulations on 5k. Um, and I uh, can't think of a nicer person, uh, for uh, these milestones. So I, I wish you the best, my friend. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, my last question to you guys real quick before we go off, what cover do you have? Oh yeah. I, I knew, I knew you guys had it. Okay. So me and Philip are rocking the same. Okay. We all match. We're, we're all matching. <laughs> wow. Do you guys have tweed blankets on too? I don't have pants on. <laughs> <laughs> the Patreon stream starts right after this. No, uh, <laughs> I, I, I really, I saw a signed, uh, like a different cover, uh, paperback on eBay or hardback on eBay. I was going to buy it. It's up to $350. I was like, ah, never mind. Ooh. I can't do it. Yeah. yeah. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll definitely have you guys back on if you're available for Tolva Hounds. I would love to have you both um, back and, and we'll try to get the other usual suspects in here. Maybe we'll get AP and Alan. That would be amazing. It'd be five hours, be but it'd fantastic. be amazing. <laughs> yeah, be a I want to unpack in that book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's going to be uh, a lot of grief, to be honest. <laughs> it's heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everyone, if you, I'm sure you already are, but definitely go subscribe to Philip and Joanna. Uh, you have linked their channels down below in the description. Um, hit like on this video. It helps people actually see this after in the algorithms. And this is going to be hopefully a resource for people reading through the series for the first time. So go ahead and hit like if you liked it. Dislike if you disliked. Um, you're probably already subscribed, but I have a Patreon down in the description. Optional, but always appreciated. And uh, Philip, Joanna, we'll see you again soon. Chat, we love you. And uh, until I see you next time, be good, be safe. And remember to always keep turning the page.